Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the regular meeting of council to order. Our clerk today will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Uh, given that we're headed in camera, I would ask for a procedural motion to proceed in camera. Moved, Councillor Bonner, seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much.
the regular meeting of council October the 4th, and I want to first recognize that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry, and tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with the Community Charter Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272 and Ministerial Order number M192 governing open meetings. As the province has moved into phase three of the reopening plan, question period has been reinstated for those in attendance. I'm not encouraging you tonight. That was a small joke. For agenda items only, the question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left. If during, any, during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. At the start of question period, the chair will call up those who have signed to the podium to address council. And the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry, and we have a number tonight. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. The first item for late items this evening is agenda item 8B, Literacy Central Vancouver Island, the addition of the PowerPoint presentation. Agenda item 8C, Emergency Preparedness Month, adding PowerPoint presentation. Agenda item 8D, Community Safety Audits, add delegation Tim McGrath regarding Nanaimo Neighborhood Network Support. Agenda item 12A, Development Variance Permit Application number DVP425 for 508 8th Street, adding a delegation from Sean Large, the General Manager of Liquor Plus. And finally, Your Worship, the addition of agenda item 12I, Appointment of a Bylaw Officer. And that's everything. Thank you very much, Ms. Gurry. Motion for adoption of the, of, the, of the agenda as amended. Moved, Councillor Bonner. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated. Moved, Councillor Bonner. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. I have a fairly short mayor's report tonight. Firstly, though, I, I want to say thank you uh, to all of the good citizens who came out in such numbers on Thursday last week. It was an impressive and important day for this community as we move down the road to truth and reconciliation in this country. Uh, and tonight, um, I will uh, welcome all of you now before I get into my prepared remarks and say thank you very much for the uh, special attendance of so many very special people tonight for what is a, uh, a unique and not very often conferred honor by this city. Uh, it's emergency preparedness month. So uh, fires and earthquakes, storms, potential floods, the city of Nanaimo wants everyone to be prepared. For the second year in a row, the city is dedicating the month of October to raising awareness on emergency preparedness. Uh, beginning with Fire Prevention Week, uh, October 3rd to 9th, in partnership with the National Fire Protection Association, the city will share messages and about learning the sounds of fire safety. The week of October 10th, residents can get ready for an emergency, such as an earthquake, by preparing an emergency kit, signing up for call alerts, and creating an emergency plan. Um, the Great Shakeout and Roll Drill will take place on Thursday, October 21st at 10, 10, 10 21 a.m. and will be aired on 1023 The Wave and 1069 The Wolf. A test of the city's emergency alert system, Voyant Alert, will take place on Thursday, October 28th at 10 15 a.m. And in keeping with the changing weather, the campfire ban has been lifted in the city of Nanaimo. Uh, Coastal Fire has issued an information bulletin indicating that with the recent rains and cooler weather patterns, Central Vancouver Island has been experiencing campfires are now permitted throughout the Coastal Fire area. There is uh, one item to rise and report to Ms. Gurry, and that is the appointment of Councillor Bonner to the Environment Committee, item 7B uh, of the uh, closed agenda. Congratulations, Councillor Bonner. Appreciate you taking this task on. Now, the next item on the official agenda is noted as presentations. And I suspect that all of you were here not to listen to me tonight. I am uh, delighted to welcome all of you here, as I did earlier, for uh, this very special evening in this city. Uh, the freedom of the city is considered one of the highest honors the city can bestow, with the recipient considered a freeman, which seems rather odd conferring it on Councillor Brennan, 
uh, in terms of her gender, but it is the language and it, no, it does not detract from the importance of the award. The primary purpose is to honor the outstanding efforts of a citizen and service to the community, and it must have the unanimous support of council. This tradition was adopted by the city of Nanaimo in 1940. It's been going for 81 years. And I'm delighted tonight to uh, welcome two previous recipients in attendance, both of whom I note being modest but hardworking people have chosen to sit at almost the virtual back of the auditorium tonight. That is in keeping with their, with their small egos, but not in keeping with their significant contribution to the city. Would you, I'm going to break the rules tonight. Can you give a round of applause for Bob Rolage and Diana Johnston? Tonight, Diane will be the 33rd recipient of the Freedom of the City, and she was nominated uh, and pro appropriately and council unanimously approved on June 21st. I want to thank former mayors, councillors, friends and family who are here in support of Diane. And I also want to thank, and I hope she'll stand up and take a small bow, uh, the assistant to council, Donna Stennis, and all of those who've worked so hard. <laughs> worked, oh, stand up and uh, it's an order who worked so hard to put this uh, very important evening together. I want to provide an overview of the details of Diane's uh, commitment to the city. Uh, born in Victoria, married, moved to Kitimat, and then moved to Nanaimo in 1976, Diane began her studies at Simon Fraser University, continued at Malaspina College, as it then was. That gives you an idea of her age and mine, as she nods rather sadly. She continued her studies at the University of Victoria, earning a Bachelor of Arts, uh, majoring uh, in sociology, and returned to Nanaimo in 1980 to raise her uh, very proud family, many of whom are here tonight. Her commitment to making lives better for people in our community has its roots when she joined the board of directors of the Nanaimo Association of Intervention and Development, made formerly the Nanaimo Crisis Center, assisting individuals experiencing problems with illicit drug use. Over time, uh, they changed their focus from drugs to a wider cross-section of issues and finally concentrated on two services, legal assistance and crisis counseling. In 1982, she began working at the community law office as a paralegal. Uh, that office provided legal assistance to individuals and families whose income or shelter was threatened. In 1984, the law office left NAID, creating a standalone legal service adding public legal education and community development to its list of service. From 1984 to 2002, during her tenure, the Nanaimo Community Law Office became a flagship office in Nanaimo and the province. It was under her leadership the office developed a range of excellent services to the citizens of Nanaimo whose lives were marked by poverty. With Diane at the helm, staff provided education to other legal offices in Vancouver Island and British Columbia generally, and assistance to many communities striving to develop programs to lift their citizens out of poverty. Diane and her colleagues made many presentations to Nanaimo City Council to create more affordable housing. In 1989, the staff at the Law Centre, together with the Community Education Department of Malaspina College, presented a two-day workshop to draw attention to the deplorable state of housing in Nanaimo. I guess, what is it, le plus ça change, le plus ça même, ça même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. The Nanaimo Affordable Housing Society was created by concerned citizens to bring provincial funding to Nanaimo to build decent, safe housing for low-income individuals. And the community law office was a consistent leader in Nanaimo's effort to create affordable housing all through the 80s and 90s. Indeed, Diane was appointed to the Minister's Advisory Committee on Income Assistance from 1994 to 96 to advise the Minister on ways and means to improve welfare programs in British Columbia. The province eventually closed all community law offices in BC and ultimately uh, all provincial anti-poverty services were eliminated in 2002. That's when Diane joined the staff of Povnet and continued to provide educational services to community offices to relieve poverty. Over time, she focused on creating online education courses for service providers. In 1984, she became a director on the Nanaimo Community Employment Advisory Society, which had its, its roots in an earlier federal government program, Local Employment Assistance and Development, LEAD. 
Lead corporations were developed in economically depressed regions across Canada. They were governed by volunteer boards of local business people with access to a variety of resources, including an investment fund to help entrepreneurs. Diane served on the NCAS board until 1991. In 1995, she joined the Nanaimo Youth Services Association as a director. And NYSA evolved from receiving, uh, receiving home for children into a therapeutic program for adolescents. In 1983, the association had assumed responsibility for service provision and introduced a professional childcare model for service delivery. This program continued until 1987, at which time the local Ministry of Social Services office shifted its residential programs to a parenting model. By this time, Diane was the vice chair of the board and worked to close the residential program and create a new future for Nanaimo's youth, Nanaimo's youth Services. Not wishing to slow down in any way, shape, or form, she got herself elected to the Nanaimo Board of School Trustees in 1989 and re-elected in 1991. She served on many committees, including chair of the business committee in her second term. She also served on the negotiating committee to bargain the first collective agreement with the Nanaimo Teachers Association. And I know Cindy Lowry's here tonight, and we all know how hard teachers bargain, right, Cindy? <laughs> her greatest satisfaction came from her work on the committee to create the first local education agreement for delivering educational services to the children of the Sitsimus First Nation. During her time at the community law office and as a school trustee, Diane continued to increase and improve her skills. Between 1985 and 1995, she attended numerous courses at the Justice Institute of BC, honing her communication and negotiating skills. She was able to use those skills to bring people together in ways that honored all their perspectives. In 2000, she joined the Nanaimo Employment Opportunity Advocacy Society, and during her tenure, the society purchased the former Lindsay Building on Fitzwilliam and managed the renovation to convert it into office and educational spaces. Twice uh, elected to council um, in separate terms, separate time periods, uh, to Nanaimo City Council, she served a total of 13 years. She also served on the Regional District of the Nanaimo Board and was Vice Chair of the RDN from 2011 to 2014. I'm beginning to wonder if there's really two Diane Brennans. <laughs> she was the City Representative on the Van Island Regional Library Board from 2011 to 2018. During that time, library services were expanded and improved dramatically, providing outstanding and equitable service in the north, central, and downtown locations. She was asked by the Manager of Diversity Partnerships to be a member of the Central Van Cralen Multicultural Society's Diversity Partnership. She served on that committee from 2003 to 2012. She initiated the city's annual welcome reception in 2012 for new immigrants. And the reception was held yearly until Diane stepped down from council in 2018. In 2012, she joined a committee tasked with expanding the Nanaimo Art Gallery. It was recognized to be a long-term endeavor and the Art Gallery expansion is still very much alive with that aspiration. She has always had a dedication to improving living conditions and that means housing. And during her tenure at the community law office, she concentrated on improving housing and shelter. So it was natural that when she was elected to city council, her first initiative was to advocate to legalize secondary suites. After in-depth community consultation and council discussion, her motion was passed to legalize the suites, making Nanaimo among the first, if not the first, city to legalize secondary suites in British Columbia. She prides herself in this as her most significant accomplishment as an Nanaimo city councillor. Diane's interest grew during this time uh, and uh, as a city councillor and regional director. Her passions included city and neighbourhood planning and development, including heritage preservation, environmental issues, arts and cultural development, sports and recreation, economic development, indigenous relations and reconciliation, and truest most to her heart, anti-poverty work. As a councillor, Diane was co-chair of the Safer Nanaimo Working Group with representation from all levels in the city, social services, RCMP, Island Health, Sinemic, First Nation, and staff. During that time, the city of Nanaimo won top leadership recognition in this field from the provincial government. That included housing initiatives with the BC Housing Ministry, resulting eventually in 140 units of housing approved for low barrier citizens in spite of concerted opposition due to misrepresentation and knowledge of the projects. 
Those have proved highly successful in different locations throughout our community. She has devoted herself to her community for many decades as her accomplishments demonstrate, even when there were some extreme challenges along the way. There are many stories about how people get into public service. When you're in the arena and where real change can happen and all eyes are on you, it's an arena where a good idea can touch and change the lives of many. It's never easy and you persevere. Churchill said, you make a living by what you get. We make a living by what we give. I want to bring greetings to Diane tonight from uh, MLA and Minister Malcolmson who can't be here. Um, guess what, the house is sitting. Did any of you know that? Never did when I was MLA. Which leads me to say a couple of things on a very personal note. As someone who's known the Brennans for over 40 years now, I'll try not to get emotional when I say this. But age can sometimes rob you of your passion and your compassion and your drive and your initiative. And in some people, it is only enhanced and matures and grows and comes to fulsome life. And it certainly has in Diane Brennan. I couldn't be prouder tonight than to be the mayor of this city on this particular evening and being able to present this award in a few minutes so richly deserved to my friend Diane Brennan. I am now going to ask each member of council to say a few words, starting with the senior and longest serving member of our council, Councillor Ian Thorpe. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, and, and it is truly an honor for me to say a few words on this very special occasion. When Diane Brennan's name was brought to council for this award, my first reaction, quite honestly, was that nobody was more deserving. And the more I learned of her contributions to our city over the many years, uh, the more I, I know that that is so. But uh, if I may, I would like to just give a perspective on Diane as a person and a counselor as I came to know her. Uh, we served together on council during the uh, 2014 to 2018 term, uh, did some carpooling together, and shared many experiences during those four years. It was, it was a difficult time, and I came to know and respect Diane very much and appreciated her support during those years. I have to admit that at first, my first impression was she was maybe just a little bit random, maybe a little bit disorganized, um, because picking her up to come to meetings each week, usually I'd have to wait a little while, and she'd either misplaced her keys or lost her phone or couldn't find her iPad or, or something similar. It was always an experience. But, you know, seriously, I, I soon realized, getting to know her, that behind that exterior, there was a lady of great strength and determination and tenacity. And we didn't agree on every issue politically but I could always respect the reasoned passion that she brought to the table. She thought for herself, she did her homework, and she always did what she believed was best for the community. She always stayed true to her principles, even in the face of intimidation and bullying. I was amazed at her inner strength and her bravery, and I am proud to know her. For her community service and her amazing integrity, Diane Brennan is a most worthy recipient of the Freedom of the City Award. Congratulations, Diane, and thank you for all that you have done. Now to the next longest serving member of council, Councillor Armstrong. I guess I am on. Um, thank you. Um, I got to know Diane back in 2010 when I was on Safer and Nanaimo representing the RC. To know Diane. But when I think of Diane, the first thing that comes to my mind, and it will forever, is its courage of convictions. And that's something that you don't find a lot of, but as uh, 
Councilor Thorpe said Diane truly believed in how she voted and what she stood for. And that's something I really, really respect. Every time that we had a contentious issue, you never saw Diane reading from notes. She always spoke from her heart. And I know she will continue to do that. The amount of services people heard that she's done for this community is astounding. And for me, I learned a lot from her as a, a newly elected official. We're obviously on different parts on the political spectrum, but I really respect what she brought to the table and the fact she always came well prepared and always well researched. She um, always listened respectfully. We, we, her and I would have some good go arounds in the car later sometimes about, well, what about this, what about that? But it was always respectfully done. And she made me open up a portion of my mind that I hadn't explored before when it came to poverty and housing issues that, you know, I hadn't really seen a lot of. So it was really important for me to hear that perspective. And I am very, very pleased and honored to have known her as a counselor and furthermore as a friend and, and wish you all the best in the future and, and congratulations. You're well deserving of this reward. Councillor Martman. Thank you. I have had the honour and privilege of knowing Diane for many, many years. We worked together on the Social Planning Advisory Committee and we've been in many campaigns. <clears throat> for all you have given to our community, for helping to build that better world right here at home, you are so deserving of this award. Much has been said of your leadership and all your accomplishments, but I want to take this time to acknowledge your leadership as a woman with courage and integrity. You are a role model. You have been a leader for many of us in this community, and we now have three women on our council. Thank you, Diane. I want to say thank you for blazing that trail. Thank you for our friendship and thank you for everything you've given to our beautiful city, Nanaimo. Councillor Hemmons, please. Thank you. Um, Diane, when I first uh, thought about running for council, I spent a lot of time in this room watching, observing. And then I joined a committee and I had a number of opportunities to be at the podium and address council. Um, I didn't pay attention a lot to the drama that was happening. I knew what was going on in the newspapers, but what I really did was I, sit, I sat and I observed. And I did that for almost a year. And what I observed in you was quiet, strength, steadiness, calmness, and grace. And when I think of leadership at this table, I think of you. And so it's my privilege to be here tonight, following in your path, and I'm, I'm just so grateful. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. I've known Diane um, a few years, and, uh, but I really got to know her when she was sitting roughly in this chair here. And I was up there in the audience, and uh, I, I was really proud of the, your willingness to work hard for this community and your integrity and your honesty. And as I sat up in those chairs, I said to myself, I want to be just like her when I grow up. <laughs> so about three years ago, I was walking through the hall and looking at the faces on the wall there, and I ran over to the Donna's office there, which sometimes the mayor shows up at. <laughs> I said to Don, I says, I want to nominate Diane for this award. Uh, and you cannot imagine my disappointment when I found out I couldn't. <laughs> Councillors aren't allowed to nominate. So apparently somebody else did, so that's a good thing. Uh, I just uh, wanted to thank you for being here and, and the work that you've done for this city and your uh, integrity in, in, in this work that you've done for the city. And now that you are a free man of the city of Nanaimo, I look forward to the year 2087 when we finally achieve gender parity in this most prestigious award. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bonner. Mercifully, former councillor is going to honour people by nominating them. I won't mention any names tonight. Uh, councillor Gesselbrock. 
Uh, Diane, uh, just a big heartfelt uh, thank you. Uh, we've been blessed uh, as a community to have a, a leader like you. And um, I, uh, yeah, really look up to the principled approach that you take your decisions and the integrity and the honesty. And I think uh, it's been, uh, you've been a role model for me as I've been getting into to politics. And uh, I've been really grateful to, to be able to give you a call and, and get advice on some tougher decisions. And uh, a lot of respect uh, the way that you carried yourself, uh, especially over the last um, last term, and you've been a rock uh, for this community, uh, you know, in some tougher times as well. So much respect, and I uh, couldn't uh, think of a better person to give this award. And I'm uh, glad to honor you as a free person of the city of Nanaimo. <laughs> Councillor Brown, please. Thank you, thank you, Worship, and. Uh, Diane, I think you know, everybody said lots of uh, very nice things about you and well-deserving, and I think it highlights one thing for me, is that true leaders don't make followers, they inspire other leaders. And uh, how you approached your work with goodness and grace, and I think uh, at times, and there was times with grit, um, has inspired so many, many in this room tonight. I know uh, people at this council table as well. So I think your legacy of service and commitment uh, will echo far beyond just your term at the council table and the work that you've done in the community through the values that you've, you've led with and have inspired others with. So uh, we are honored to have you in our city working for our community, um, what you have done and I know what you will do. Uh, so thank you and it's an honor to occupy this space with you tonight. Councillor Jim truly can't be with us tonight, but uh, he's asked me to read a few words on his behalf. I've known Diane since the early 1990s. Her commitment to work for and with her fellow citizens has been consistent and always aimed at improving the lives of all of us. Diane is the kind of person that works behind the scenes with no desire of any recognition of her accomplishments. She is blessed uh, with many volunteers, but I, Nanaimo rather, is blessed with many volunteers, but I would describe Diane as the cream of the crop. I congratulate her on this well-deserved recognition. Now, if I may, I'm going to provide a little explanation of what's about to happen now. Um, obviously, on behalf of the Council and the Citizens of Nanaimo, I am very honored and privileged to be able to present Diane with the official signed and sealed certificate of Freeman, which reads, the Nanaimo City Council at a meeting duly convened uh, in the Douglas Rispin Room, Vancouver Island Conference Center, City of Nanaimo, Province of British Columbia, on Monday, the 21st day of June, at which all members were present, the following <laughs> resolution was passed by unanimous vote, namely, that in pursuance of the powers vested in the City Council by statute, the freedom of the City of Nanaimo be and is hereby conferred on Margaret Diane Brennan. In recognition and appreciation for her exemplary service, contribution, and eminent public services to the citizens of the Naimo. She's also going to receive a medal, which I'm going to present her with as well, which is engraved on the back, bestowed upon Diane Brennan, 2021, June 21st. Now, Diane was very excited and <coughs> delighted to receive this honor um, because one of the benefits of being a Freeman is that you get free parking for the remainder <laughs> of your life at all city-owned pay parking lots and parkades as well as an all, all city on-street parking meters plus the Maffeo Sutton parking lot and if she takes up fishing and kayaking the Brecon boat ramp. <laughs> Diane's photo will also be placed in the official Freeman of the City Gallery outside the auditorium uh, and it'll be placed in uh, in her, in the hearts of all of us who were here tonight as well. I'm going to ask Diane to come down and join me in the circle. I will present her with the certificate. I will put the medal around her neck, hopefully not damaging that lovely corsage. And then she gets to make a little speech, which I notice she's prepared. And then we are going to finally get up off our duffers and give her a standing ovation at that point, aren't we? Yes. Diane, please. I suppose we've got to wear our masks too. Yes.
Take this off when I sleep. Well, um, before anything else, before anyone else, I want to thank Donna Stennis. Um, she arranged this, she planned it, she uh, kept me in, um, in step with everything that she was doing. She made room for me and for my um, late requests and uh, for that, I'm, I'm just so grateful for this evening, and thank you for planning this. A good evening, Mayor and Council, and um, everyone who's here this evening. First, I want to acknowledge, and I'm grateful to, this Nanaimic First Nation, upon whose traditional ancestral territory we live and work today. It's important to me to acknowledge the territory because as a child of second generation settlers growing up on Vancouver Island, I never heard spoken the traditional names of the territories. I knew nothing about that. I don't think I was unusual. So I want to make that up. So this evening, I'm proud to recognize the First Peoples of this land. And finally, I wish to acknowledge the many different Indigenous peoples who also share this land within the Snanamic Nation. I want to thank Mayor Krogh and Council for conferring this honor on me. I could not have been more surprised or more grateful. And as time passed, I began to understand it was far more than just a parking pass. <laughs> In fact, when I think about this honor, I realize that I am enormously grateful for the life I have led in Nanaimo. This is a beautiful city full of natural wonders. I'm grateful for our lakes, the rivers, the mountains and, of course, the ocean, our harbor, and the wildlife that surrounds us. I grew up in Victoria, a pretty nice place, don't you think? I've lived in the Lower Mainland and in northern BC. I've traveled across Canada, Europe, Turkey, Korea. Hats off to my um, daughter-in-law, Jung Ye. Um, all profoundly beautiful places. But I am never so grateful as when I return to this compelling city, which has been my home for the past 45 years. I acknowledge the citizens of this city too. Nanaimo is a community where people take care of each other. We care about one another. The caring nature of our citizens is the reason I stay here. I learned from our volunteers, neighbors, and friends to become immersed in social issues. I knew I would need to put effort into maintaining and building safe, decent housing for our citizens and ensuring that individuals and families had enough to eat and earned a fair income to allow them 
to lead a rewarding life. My family enjoyed abundance, and my children had opportunities here. Like my hero, Tommy Douglas, what I had, I wanted for others. Now I'm going to cry, so I stop this for a sec. When the provincial government did a core review of provincial programs in 2002, they decided that walking beside people with disabilities, people who were unemployed, who were poor, hungry, and homeless, they didn't need help. The government decided they didn't need help in having their rights enforced. Every government-funded poverty law office in British Columbia was closed. That's over 60. It was a municipal election year, and I was encouraged to toss my hat in the ring. So when I was first elected to council in 2002, I had a lot to learn. I had observed this council from afar, and I wasn't sure how I how I would fit in. I was an anti-poverty activist and a woman. Both traits were scarce commodities at City Hall in 2002. The Council of the Day did not spend a lot of time on social or equity issues. I wanted to change things, but I didn't know, I knew I couldn't do it if I was relegated to being the lady councillor who did good works. I wanted to be a true player in the game. I wanted to frame the future of our city in all its aspects. I remember at the council at the time was led by Mayor Gary Corpan. Gary called me and asked me if I wanted to chair the social planning committee. I think he was surprised when I said no thanks. I wanted to be involved in what I called the hard committees because I knew that social issues were seen as soft issues in the political world of the time. I had learned that when our office got closed down in this city. I had learned a very good lesson. Um, Gary graciously agreed that I could sit on another committee, and I am very grateful to him for recognizing that. He gave me a different committee with a different focus. It was a hard one. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I also knew that I had to gain credibility on hard issues before I could persuade the council to work with me on soft issues. One of the seminal issues during my term on council came when the issue of secondary suites came before council. The policy of the day did not allow them. If council did not change the policy, this suite would have to be shut down. Then, just as now, we lacked affordable housing, and this place, it, and this place was near the university where student housing was in short supply. And because it was a new build, so it, it was up to code. I couldn't understand this. I couldn't accept this. So as I walked out that morning from the briefing, I took Larry Councillor Larry, Larry McNabb aside and said, hey, Larry. Will you be my seconder if I make a motion to begin the process to allow secondary suites? Larry said to me, absolutely. And he did. And after that, we were on our way to creating a very large new stock of safe, decent, affordable housing in a compressed period of time. They were already out there. We just had to recognize them and stop closing them. Going forward from there, most new housing was being built, either had suites or was a suite or was suite ready, which means 
the plumbing was there, the electricity was there, everything was there. If you bought this place, you could put in a suite, no problems. You would have a mortgage helper, and you would um, help with the housing crisis we were experiencing at the time. For me, as Len said, this was the most important accomplishment I had in my whole time on council. Besides thanking um, council for this award, I want to thank my nominators. And actually, from something Len said, I'm, I, thought, <laughs> I thought I was allowed to know them because I got a memo about it. Am I? Yes? All right. <laughs> I mean, Donna said yes. So um, I want to thank my nominators. I want to thank Merv Unger, Kim Smythe, and Dave Hammond. Each one of these men helped me move forward in my political career. Ultimately, we became friends. Merv is usually the one that surprises most people. But no one should be surprised. No one should be surprised. Merv and I became partners in pushing social housing forward. He and I toured housing in Vancouver that was home to women who were experiencing very hard times. Not once did Merv flinch when we brought home ideas to implement in Nanaimo. I don't think people ever knew how instrumental he was in building homes for Nanaimo's unhoused. He deserves your recognition, recognition for that achievement. Thank you, Murray. Kim Smythe and I developed a lasting friendship when we worked to save and bring new improvements to Nanaimo, and in particular, to the downtown. The two of us became determined to fight back when we saw the improvements being lost due to infighting on council. It was painful to hear our historic downtown referred to as just another mall. Thank you, Kim, for continuing to work to improve the things that make our city an outstanding one. And I think we can all thank Kim for that. Dave Hammond was a great supporter and a mentor to me during my first years on council. I always considered him to be a calm and reasoned thinker. If he was involved in a project, I felt we were halfway, halfway to something good for this city. I still think about Dave and the projects he championed that have improved everyday life of this city. Thank you, Dave. And Dave? Thank you for encouraging Wendy Pratt to run for council. That was a great treat for all of us. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank the women with whom I share this honor. Carol Matthews, I know you're not here tonight, but you told me you would watch. You were my stalwart friend throughout my time on council but never more so than during my last term. Carol, your keen sense of social justice and your sense of humor has been a touchstone for me as I moved through my career. So thank you, Carol. Diana Johnstone, my friend, you taught me so much about being gracious, but tough. I may not have reached your level of graciousness, <laughs> but I think we are a match on the toughness scale. <laughs> we worked together with some very strong men, and we enjoyed working with them. But we matched them issue for issue. So thank you for that, Diana. Much appreciated. <clears throat> Wendy Pratt, you and I were made for one another. We put our shoulders to the wheel and we accomplished much in a short time. In the face of much adversity, I was so grateful to have you as my friend through good times and dark times, and we had both. 
We were a force together because we recognized if we weren't together, we would fall apart. Cheryl Armstrong. You made the end of my career a positive experience. We had fun together. We had some scary times too. We leaned on each other and I consider you a great friend. I'd say you and I have proved you don't have to have the same politics to have the same end goals. And I'd say that's true for Jeep Manhas and Arjan. We don't have exactly the same politics, but we sure know where we're going and where we want this city to be. I'd be remiss if I did not mention Mayor Bill McKay. We had a wild ride, didn't we, Bill? <laughs> Again, our friendship surprised many and continues to do so. But we held hands, put our heads down, and tried very hard to behave. And we shouldered on. I couldn't have made it without you. And finally, I want to recognize the lasting friendships I made while on council. <clears throat> Jeep Manhas and his family. Ron Cantillon. Bill Holdham. Larry McNabb, bless his soul. And John Rattan, Ted Greaves, and of course, George Anderson. I frequently I want to say the late George Anderson, but I know that's wrong. <laughs> I know that's wrong. <clears throat> And the staff, what, what can I say? The staff at the city of Nanaimo are brilliant. They are second to none. You were an inspiration to me during the good times and the dark times. And I would have to say, especially during the dark times. I relied on you and the work you produced. I knew that if I relied on you and conferred with you and referred to you, we would make it through. And we did. We did. The staff here are among the most competent and encouraging people. And I don't want anyone to forget that. They work so hard. And what they have in their hearts and what they're pushing towards is to make the city of Nanaimo a better place and to do the things that their council directs them to do. So if you've got a beef with, with the stuff, let your councillors know. And keep up the outstanding work, you staff. And if I may thank Mayor Croak for being such a supportive friend to me, you and I go a long way back, and we've supported each other in good times and in tough times. But you have always been by my side, and I can't begin to thank you for the privilege of having freedom of the city. And by the way, that's what I call it, freedom of the city. I don't try to mess around and twist things. I never say I am a freeman of the city. I have always been given freedom of the city. And you know what, I'm on the Island Board of Health and, and, and I have a parking pass for that too. <laughs> Just saying. I also want to thank my two very good friends. Um, this one in front of me, um, Terry Flower. Phone, uh, when the phone rings now, uh, Rosa comes down. It's Terry Flower on the phone for you. Um, when the phone rings, I say to, to Rosa, who do you think that is? That's Terry Flower, I think, she says. <laughs> and it is. And Darcy Olson, you stayed by my side. You stuck with me. You gave me a hard time many times. But you helped me stay on the straight and narrow. And for that, I appreciate you. And finally, my family. This is a tough one. 
Jamie, you encouraged me to reach, to stand on my tiptoes and reach. You carried me when I, when I failed, which was not uncommon. We stood together and we reached together so many times. So many times I've lost count. We supported one another and we learned together. We learned what it means to be a team. And I dare say we have succeeded in reaching our goals. We are still intact as a team and we still lean on each other and occasionally we still stand on our tiptoes and reach for something that looks like it's out of reach. I wouldn't have made it without you and given the chance I wouldn't miss a day of it. I'm going to say that because of your 17 years as a trustee, many of them as chair, the school district of Nanaimo and its citizens are better off for it. <laughs> now my children, <clears throat> they're the bedrock of our family. Brendan, Megan, Darcy, and Alex. And their partners, Dave, Christine, Jung Ye, and Annie. <clears throat> eight children, eight grandchildren, I'm sorry. Some of them are here tonight with their partners. One just got married last month. Um, I want to tell you I have eight grandchildren and one more for those who are counting. It's a boy. And, and Annie and Alex are the parents. I love you all to bits, each one of you. You were always supportive of me, you guys. And it, I'm sure it, it was not easy sometimes if I went out and you all had to stay home together, then you'd have to phone Auntie Cindy and tell her, Darcy's being mean. Megan won't stop it. Auntie Cindy, put up your hand, Auntie Cindy. Always, always sorted them out. And oh, I am so grateful for that. And you kids were always so patient. I'm so proud to call you my children, and I hope you are proud of me today, too. Mayor Krogh, counselors, Cheryl Armstrong, Don Bonner, Tyler Brown, this is alphabetical, I'm not dumb. Ken, ben Gesselbrecht, Aaron Hemmons, Zenny Martman, and Jim Turley. I am so grateful. Gee, I've missed somebody. Yeah. Ian. Okay. <laughs> you you nailed it, right? I'm just too scatterbrained. <laughs> that is true. It's true. Anyway, I'm grateful to know all of you and to have worked with each one of you in different capacities. <sighs> Cheryl, Aaron, and Zenny. You took us from only two women to three very competent counselors. I thank you for that. I'm grateful for the time that you spend doing this. I hope you keep at it, and I hope we can continue to add to it. There are so many challenges ahead of Nanaimo, but from my view, this city is in very steady hands. Thank you. So what are the first words our newest freeman of the city said to me? Was it too long? <laughs> Spoken like a true politician. 
And let me say in all candor and honesty, we could have listened to you for a couple of days. And I think we all look forward, and particularly the women in this community, look forward to many more years of guidance in how you should perform public service through the good times and the bad. So again, on behalf of this city, Diane Brennan, thank you ever so much. We are so proud of you. This is such a wonderful night for this city. I hope you go out and do as much celebration as Bonnie Henry possibly allows. <laughs> And, and go secure in the knowledge that you will never get another parking ticket in the city of Nanaimo. <laughs> don't forget this. I'll bring it. Thank you again to all of you for coming tonight and making it the special evening that is for the city and for Diane and her family and her many supporters and friends. Thank you. We are now going to have a 10 minute recess. So those of you who want to can go and celebrate. Those of you who are council addicts or the season ticket holders, as someone once said, are welcome to stay. Thank you. This is the 2018 redux of the lighting at Nanaimo's historic bastion. I've had the pleasure of being part of the relighting project on this amazing building in downtown Nanaimo. So what we did is we've replaced the original high pressure sodium lights, which basically did an okay job of lighting up the bottom 10 feet of the building and replaced them with modern LED lighting that has the capacity to change color. We can run through a number of different colors that we have pre-programmed here in a pink, a purple, a green. Uh, probably my favorite on here is Rainbow Chase for Pride Week. It's, uh, it'll actually run all the way around the building all the time. With this new technology, organizations can now request that the bastion be lit to promote their cause by going to the City Nanama website and following the instructions. Go to Your Government, Bastion Lighting Requests, complete the Lighting Request form, and submit. You will hear from us within a couple days if your request has been approved, and the Bastion will be lit in the colors that you have requested. If you have any questions, please contact the Mayor's Office at 250-755. So the next time you're in downtown Nanaimo at night, come on and check out the new dynamic lighting at The Bastion. Oh, hey, Tiana. Hey. This sure is the coldest rink in town. <laughs> <laughs> wow, your goalie is keeping you guys in the game. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, oh, oh man, that's hot. Sorry, that's the way I like it. Oh. oh. Go, 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 go. Penalty shot. Scalds from hot drinks are a leading cause of hospitalization for children under five. Two minutes, down to the front, unsportsmanlike conduct. Hot tea and coffee will cause serious burns to a child in less than a second. Got a kid? Use the lid.
What we have here is the real ice technology that was installed at the Nanaimo Ice Centre. It uh, allows us to use cold water from traditionally hot water that we used to use for making ice. Basically, the water will come in through the bottom, go in through a vortex idea, uh, making the air bubbles microscopic in size, which makes a better, more dense sheet of ice. Differences that you'll see with the real ice is there's less snow developed, so uh, that's easier for cleaning, and also it's a denser, harder, clear ice. So the ice skaters will certainly enjoy that. And the city plans to uh, implement real ice at our other two arenas as well. Some of the other efficiencies we've implemented in this facility are LED lights in some areas, and we've also, in the last few years, installed a higher efficiency refrigeration system, which lowers our energy costs. Both Sambonis at our facility are now electrically operated, so there's no harmful emissions, and uh, they're very quiet as well. So what this means for the city is that we're able to use less energy and also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more beneficial to the environment. Welcome to the city's South Fork Water Treatment Plant. This is where we take water that we would collect in our lakes and rivers, pipe it, we filter it and treat it before we send it off to the city's distribution system in your taps. This facility actually does a better job than most home filtration systems. The water that comes into your home that you use every day, that you bathe in every day, that you wash your clothes in every day, is cleaner than anything you can get anywhere. Here you see filtration in action. It's kind of like watching paint dry. There's nothing to really see. But if you look in the tank, you'll see the froth on the top. That's the dissolved organic matter. And when we aerate the tank, that froths up. And that's why that's up there. We take all the little particles, all the organic matter, any insects or bugs that might be in the water, and pathogens that we're trying to filter out, they're all gone. We filter the water using a series of membranes. So what we're looking at here is a membrane filtration module. So when I talk about the membranes filtering the water, this is what we're filtering the water with. And while you might think that the water flows through like the baleen of a whale, it's not true. These are hollow fiber membranes. So each of these little tiny strands are hollow, just like a shoelace and the membrane is wrapped around the outside of these tiny little hollow fibers. So these sit in a bath of water, raw water, and then we pull the water through the wall of the straw or the shoelace, and then it travels along and it collects in this vessel at the end here. And this hole at the end is where we pull the water out. And the membranes are like a, an almost impermeable waterproof layer that we pull the water through. So now we're just left with clean, pure drinking water. Take care. You are looking at Unit 400 from the City of Nanaimo Public Works Department. This truck is called our paint truck. It puts down most of the center line in the City of Nanaimo. Right now on the back, 
we have Holly. Today she is in charge of keeping the line straight. She can move the wheel back and forth, right or left, which controls this paint gun. And then right behind the paint system, there's a glass beads that are dispensed onto the fresh wet paint for retro reflectivity at night. The painted lines can last one or two years. Most center lines in Nanaimo are painted every year. Um, the white crosswalks and stop bars in thermoplastic can last anywhere from two to seven years, depending on traffic flow. And on the back here, Derek will be kind enough to be dropping cones onto the fresh wet paint so vehicles do not drive over it. There's a lot of moving parts, high pressure, traffic, a lot of things going on at one time and we're all working together. There's a lot of prep work before to make the lines straight. There's a lot of pulling of lines. Most of our equipment has guidelines and markers. It's a very rewarding job working for the Public Works Department. Lots of things go on and you stay in touch with the heartbeat of our city. We're here today to make a couple street names. There was some vandalism in town and we're just going to make a replacement. In the roads today we're doing our Dundas Street and Bruce Avenue. They're all 8 inch and we use three different sizes, mostly 24 inch, 32 inch and 36 inch. We do use a consistent font with street names. This is actually my metal blank, so the only material here is the material that I actually will cut out in vinyl. From here, we have to take out the vinyl that's not needed, which is the outer. So all we want to do is save the inside border. From here, we actually have to put a tra transfer tape on it. And what this does is it allows us to take the blue vinyl and pull it away from the clear backing that it's on so we can apply it to our aluminum blank. Now that we have our two sheeted piece of vinyl, we take our aluminum blank, which has high density diamond grade, which you can see behind me, we have all different colors. We have orange, yellow, white, depending on the type of signs. Most of our white signs are regulatory and the yellow ones are warning signs. And right here, all I'm doing is pushing the transfer tape a little tighter to the vinyl. And then from there, we peel it back, our plastic, which basically leaves us with a big sticker. We put it on the aluminum. And when we're done here, we take our transfer tape off and as you can see, we're left with Dundas. All right, everyone. It's been a very exciting evening so far, but now down to the work of council. Uh, we're still under presentations, and the first uh, presentation following the award, award to Diane Brennan is the Literacy Central Vancouver Island. I understand George Anderson, the president, and Samantha Letourneau, executive director, will be presenting to council. Please. <coughs> Good morning, or good afternoon, good <laughs> evening. I don't even know what time it is. It's been a long day, but uh, thank you very much, Mayor and Council, for allowing us to be here today and to present to you on what Literacy Central Vancouver Island is doing. Uh, furthermore, on behalf of the board, we would like to thank all of you for the work that you have been doing on behalf of all residents in Nanaimo throughout this pandemic. There has been a lot of challenges, and because of all of you, we are slowly making it through through this pandemic. So I want to thank each and every one of you, and uh, on behalf of our board, thank you so much. So I will give the floor to Samantha Letourneau, who is our executive director, who will speak to you about the updates of Literacy Central Vancouver Island over the past 30 years. 
Thank you, Samantha. Okay. Good evening. I'm going to take this off. Please. Hi. <laughs> So it is our 30th year of operation, uh, and in that time, Literacy Central Vancouver Island has served over, oh, I would say 600 adult, 6,000, sorry, adult learners with their literacy needs, reading, writing, numeracy, and our program has, our programming has expanded, and that's what I'm here today, to this evening to speak about. Uh, our, our program has expanded greatly, providing support to family, Indigenous literacy programs, youth literacy programs, and doing liter what we call literacy outreach on the street, working with people who are homeless, underhoused, helping them with their basic literacy needs, and advocating and connecting them to other services in the community. So I'm just gonna skip by that one. So our adult literacy program currently is supporting over 100 adult learners from the age of 19 and up. And this can be with ba basic reading levels, uh, people that did not graduate from high school, maybe have a reading level of grade five or six uh, because of certain things that have happened in their life or experiences or because of um, discrimination and racism didn't return to the school system. So there's a wide variety as to why people uh, come and see us. And so we help with reading writing, numeracy, digital literacy, either in a one-to-one -one format or a small group setting. I'm watching this time, but it's like it's already at two minutes. Uh, <laughs> our adult literacy outreach program really took off in the last three years, and this one's important for mayor and council to understand. This was funding that we received from the social response um, grant and the adult and the and the program is called Word on the Street. And so it started with us going into shelters and doing basic literacy activities, poetry writing workshops, asking residents who stay in shelters what they would like to focus on. When the second year that we received funding was the year of COVID, and we had to figure out how we could still provide relevant services to people who are underhoused or homeless and need support with their literacy needs or need to access additional services that they may not understand or able to comprehend what those services are there for. And with the support of a literacy tutor, we're able to navigate through systems like housing applications, applying to ABE, et cetera. So what we, one of the things that we, the word of COVID pivoted with was we created a word on the street bulletin board that hangs in the front window of our bookstore. Uh, this was because at the beginning of COVID, if people remember, there was no access to the library meaning people who are underhoused or living in poverty don't have access to a computer. Uh, they don't have access to the internet. Uh, and so they go to the library. And when the library shut down, for example, the downtown library, they had no way to access information. And so we created this word on the street bulletin board that is updated weekly with uh, news stories, uh, written in clear and concise plain language so it reaches out to various literacy levels. And we also have a contribution every month in there. This is a booklet we hand, hand out at shelters when we're doing street outreach to have people who are underhoused or homeless share their story or their artwork or however they choose to express themselves. So this is called Express Yourself and they, Inside is a very easy written submission form, again, through the lens of literacy, that they can just tear it out, come in and see us, or th throw it through our mail slot. They sign that they want it published, and we put it up on the board. And there's some amazing stories from individuals in this community of their experiences of being underhoused. And what it's done for many of them is they come back and see us, and then they want to access our digital literacy program, or they want to work on financial literacy, or they want to connect with a tutor one-to-one. -one. So it's a really effective po uh, tool to engage with people who are incredibly vulnerable in this community. And that's thanks to the social response grant that we were able to do all this and continue on with it. Our, fam our family literacy program provides tutor supports in the school district. 
We also run a special program. This is one of the, the uh, children from the program. It's called Immigrant Parents, Helping Immigrant Parents with Their Literacy Skills, and we do it in partnership with the Central Vancouver Island Multicultural Society. We work with the families to work on their reading skills so they can support their children with uh, long life learning, basic literacy strategies, and uh, it takes place in the daycare. This year we had, to, at Multicultural Society this year, we had to again, like everyone, figure out how we were still gonna be able to offer the uh, immigrant literacy program. And we designed it to be online. And an interesting thing is we had more parents and grandparents, because often in, uh, especially with the Syrian families that we're working with, have extended family living with them. They all took part uh, in the eight sessions that we offer. And to be clear, everything we offer at Literacy is completely free. We don't charge anyone. We just charge you to come and buy books at our bookstore to support our literacy programs. <laughs> um, and our Indigenous Literacy program that I think people aren't aware of what we're doing here. Uh, currently, we have what's called the Red Feather Podcast. This is funded by the First Nation Health Authority. And this is exploring literacy, wellness, and connecting with Indigenous knowledge keepers to uh, share stories. Our learners have shared stories on here. It's available, you can find it on Spotify. It's hosted by our Indigenous Literacy Coordinator, Amy Shalafu. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's a really fantastic program to listen to people, what their needs are, or their journey to education and knowledge. Okay, I'm gonna go come back to that one in a minute. I don't see one more thing in our Indigenous Literacy Program. Again, we offer free tutoring, group sessions, and we're currently working in partnership with VIU, the Adult Basic Education uh, Program, to provide what's called the Literacy Survivor Circle Circle for elders uh, who went to residential schools that never learned how to read or write. And so we are helping them register for the courses. We are helping them get transportation there. We are helping them with tutors for additional support uh, to make sure that these elders have an opportunity to read, to write. One of the elders we're working with just wants to have uh, get her driver's license. And so she comes in weekly and we, we work with her on the, her learners right now, the first step. Um, also, and all of you will get this gift, we create indigenous language cards of four languages that through our outreach, in particular the outreach that Amy is doing um, in Nanaimo, they're the four languages that we identified of indigenous people that we're meeting that are used here. Each of you is going to get a package with our, our brochures uh, our, our learning guides, etc., and on top of it is four language, four six languages, the cards, and you're part of the reconciliation because we are in the time of truth and reconciliation. Is to figure out what la indigenous language that is, and I'll leave that for you. You can email me and tell me you figured it out. <laughs> um, so our youth program started three years ago by uh, an, an anonymous donor that was watching what our society was doing and saw, uh, was interested in supporting us. Um, and so the foundation of our youth literacy program was really the creation of the place publication. Um, this was funded by the BC Multiculturalism. The first publication was all Indigenous youth voices in the central Vancouver Island region. You'll all get this as a gift as well. Our second one was working with youth who are underhoused or homeless to be uh, sharing their experiences. And our third one that we're just completing right now, which you see the poster there, is for BIPOC and LGBTQ plus youth to share their stories. So the Place publication has really become a platform for young people to share their stories, their poems, and to be able to express themselves. And it's also a very innovative way to help young people work on their literacy skills. We sell these, we end up selling these in the bookstore, and all the proceeds go back into our youth programming. Um, 
During COVID, we were also worked in partnership with Nanaimo Aboriginal Center doing outreach. So we did youth literacy outreach. Uh, you, uh, it's our previous youth coordinator there, Delaney with the short hair, and Ruby who was with Nanaimo Aboriginal Center. And we would go and provide journals, resources, try to connect young people with other resources in the community. Um, it was a really good partnership with Naima Aboriginal Center and in that time, so it was from August, sorry, from March till August 2020, we probably met an estimate about 80 youth who were underhoused or homeless in the central Vancouver Island region. And some of them continue to come back to literacy and engage in our youth literacy program. Uh, those are my findings. And last but not least is our computer program. So our computer program provides free computers for learners in need. Uh, we accept donations, we refurbish them and build them, rebuild them, and we, we give them to learners who can't afford a computer. Again, this is all free. Uh, and during the start of COVID, we supplied a lot of computers to both school districts 68 and 69. We went through a five month supply of computers in three weeks. Um, so this year we've been rebuilding our computer stock to be able to, to, be able to provide uh, computers to many learners in our community. And this is just thank you to our funders. I don't know where George is going. Oh, he's there. Um, <laughs> But I thought it was important to demonstrate to Mayor and Council of the many things that are happening at Literacy Central Vancouver Island. We're providing a lot of support to very diverse groups, to incredibly vulnerable groups that uh, we're happy to keep our programming relevant to the needs of this community. And I really encourage you to come in and say hi and check out what's happening there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we do end our presentation today, uh, Samantha did mention that we do have a few items left for you that we would like you to obviously do a, do a little bit of homework with respect to the uh, truth and reconciliation that Literacy Central Vancouver Island is doing, but also hope that Council will have a discussion amongst itself. We are in our 30th year, and perhaps there is an opportunity for the city to partner with Literacy Central Vancouver Island with respect to the work that it's doing. There's a book wall that's going up that is looking for funders and perhaps here is an opportunity in which city council can actually provide some level of funding to be able to ensure that these programs continue. Yeah, so what George is referring to is for our 30th anniversary, we have a book donor wall. So instead of doing the traditional donor wall, the banner that wraps around our store people can put in a pledge of $30 for a single book, $100 for, um, a, a, so a book this way is $30, a book this way is $100, because you can put more names on it, or you can get an encyclopedia set for $300 and put <laughs> your whole family's name on it. Um, and, and it's our goal to just uh, run this fundraiser again to help put money back into literacy. One of the things I didn't say is that literacy, in my experience, and I've been working in the not-for-profit industry in this community for about 20 years now, um, and I will say, and I've worked with the Multicultural Society, the Women's Center, uh, Nanaimo Food Share Society, but literacy is definitely one of the, the most underfunded uh, services, both on a federal, provincial, and a fe federal and provincial level, so, um, we, we would great, graciously appreciate your support. <laughs> yes. and especially in what council can do and speaking with the ministers with respect to literacy issues, but also with respect to the, uh, the programs that literacy is trying to, trying to put forward. Again, there's lots of computers that I know that the city is using and perhaps this is an opportunity in which council can ask about whether or not there's a staff report that the staff can do and see about what partnership opportunities there are between the city of Nanaimo and Literacy Central Vancouver Island. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Certainly appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much, but you don't get to go yet. We have a couple of questioners. <laughs> Councillor Armstrong, please. Thank you. You mentioned that you were working with the shelters to bring in your programs. Have you looked at working with the supportive housing units throughout the city? 
Yeah, so that we're in discussion with uh, one of the supportive housing units to see how we can bring tutors into that space. We're also, we were also recently asked if we would consider, uh, again, working with elders but pro uh, that are in a cooking program that aren't able to read recipes to provide support, tutor support there so that they understand what measure the measurements mean, uh, what the ingredients are, et cetera. But it is something that we're definitely looking into, yep. Thank you, and thank you for much for all the great work you do in the community. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship, uh, through you. Uh, just with the um, computer program, uh, you take in older computers or computers that aren't being used, and is there like a third party that refurbishes them? No, how, how does that work? We refurbish them. We do all the work. Okay. So computers are donated to us. Older computers, some of them we can't refurbish. So we're, you know, it depends on the age of them. We really need laptops because there is an incredible demand for laptops. Um, but yeah, the age is. We have to be careful because sometimes they can't be, yeah, they just can't be fixed, right? Or a learner is just not compatible with the le what the learner needs to do, right? So, um, so our IT administrator, Brian, who's been with the society for probably, I want to say 22 years, refurbishes all our computers along with an incredibly dedicated uh, volunteer who's been probably with the agency for at least 15 years, and they rebuild them all and put programs like uh, Microsoft on there, uh, Word doc, Excel, basic programs on there for learners. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I could wax on for a long time about the importance of literacy and what it means. And I can tell you that in my professional career, having acted for a number of people who were illiterate, what a profound barrier it was to them achieving anything remotely resembling their potential in life and the frustration that it led to. Uh, and when they got into programs such as that offered by Through Literacy Central Vancouver Island, it really was a miracle change in their lives. So on behalf of Council and the City, thank you very much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where do I leave your gifts? I can pass them to Sheila. Okay. The next is Emergency Preparedness Month. Karen Lindsay, our manager of emergency programs. Ms. Lindsay, good evening. Good evening. So I'm just going to take a few moments of your time to talk a little bit about what's going on this month. We're very cognizant of the fact that people are tired, especially with respect to emergencies with COVID over the last year and a half and some of the other things that have gone on. So it's, it's a bit challenging for people to, you know, be looking at this and thinking about it and, you know, preparing for something else. But I think we'd be remiss in not taking the opportunity to educate people on it and trying to get them take some even nominal steps towards getting themselves ready for some of the other things that we can see. So what is happening? So we have Fire Prevention Week ongoing right now from October 3rd to 9th, and the theme on that is to know the sounds of fire. On October 21st, the Great BC Shakeout happens at 1021. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, there will be a test of our mass notification or emergency call alert system. And uh, this is building on last year's success in conducting kind of an emergency preparedness themed month. Um, the Great BC Shakeout gets kind of a lot of mileage or a lot of um, media profile. So it was nice to kind of build on that and take some other things and place them into the months to try and get people, uh, encourage them to kind of get themselves prepared. So as far as the emergency preparedness, there's going to be ongoing education for people on preparing for emergencies. And that includes knowing what the risks are, making a plan, and really importantly, building that kit. Uh, the city as a whole, we prepare internally as an organization, um, and that's everything from uh, meeting severe weather planning, our emergency operations center. So we're always doing ongoing preparedness at the senior level and throughout the organization with staff. So what we're wanting the residents to do is to prepare themselves. 
Um, we'll be taking a variety of opportunities through media, so there'll be heavy social media engagement, we'll be on the airwaves, we'll be um, putting, today I think it went live where we actually have a virtual presentation where I kind of go through the steps of how do you make a kit. Um, in the past, you know, our pre-COVID years, this was done typically in person, but uh, we're being a little more creative and trying to find different ways to reach out to our, our people. In addition, and I don't know if you'll recall this, I know you have a lot on your plate, but a couple of years ago we looked at uh, developing what was called a Chirp app, and it was done in partnership with the University of British Columbia. The city of Nanaimo was a host city on it, and the app was, it was a mobile app for smartphones, which the intended um, outcome of it was to help people to build their emergency plans, build their kits, prepare their families and loved ones. COVID's delayed that, but we're hoping that that will come out towards the end of the year this year. It just the mechanics of it with COVID was very challenging for the students at UBC. So we're a sponsor city for that and we're working in partnership with the City of Parksville, City of, or Town of Qualicum and uh, Tofino. So we're all working away on that and we're hoping that will come out next year. Then as mentioned on October 21st at 10.21, so they always coincide with the date, uh, the ShakeOut BC is happening. Again, with COVID in mind, uh, it, it can be challenging for people to actually conduct the evacuation drill. So what we're encouraging business, residents and our organization through the leadership of our OHS department, we'll be actually talking about it, educating it, reviewing plans, just kind of Familiar, familiarizing ourselves or refamiliarizing ourselves with those protocols of drop, cover, and hold on. And then also what we're really encouraging residents and businesses, as well as our city has already registered for it, is to register your participation, however that looks. So whether it be education, whether it be reviewing your plans or going over your business continuity plans, whatever it is, is to register because it gives us a good idea of kind of where the city is and, and who is participating and how they're participating. So it gives us some really good information and stats. So when we talk about the drop, cover and hold, I just gave you a couple visuals as to why we do that. So they always say the earthquake isn't what kills you, it's the stuff around you and that's often the truth. So the drop, cover and hold is, is very critical for people. I always see it, liken it to the fire, fire drill that we learned as children. We want to get that you know, muscle memory going with the drop, cover and hold. We'll kind of end up the month uh, with our emergency notification test and that will be on October 28th at 10.15. Um, I checked today and we've, we've gone up, I think, 50 people in the last week, so I'm pretty excited about that, but we're at 12,090 people right now registered. So someone look at that and say it's low with the population that we have, um, but typically what we see with these emergency notification systems is something happens in the community or there's the test that kind of prompts people and gets them engaged. There's a ton of material on the City of Nanaimo website, videos to walk them through it. Um, the beauty of this system, and we've only had it in place for a couple of years, is that we have the ability to call, uh, push out a notification using smartphones, we can text and we can email. So it gives people a lot of opportunity to receive that notification and get that critical information in addition, um, we can geographically isolate. And I also want to really um, emphasize that this system is used where the city has jurisdiction over the emergency. So we don't just use it and start sending, you know, everything that's going on everywhere. It's things that we're managing or emergencies that we're, we're kind of controlling or responding to. So it doesn't get used often and there's a lot of discussion on is that good or bad so you can get fatigue with overuse and then underuse you you might get uh, complacency so we're, we're starting with this once a year test to try and see how this works and to get people signed up and that's all I have and I'll turn it over if there's any questions or concerns thank you very much Miss Lindsay good. I don't see any questions Perfect. Which is probably a good thing for you. Thank you <laughs> it is. Home. Thank you for participating tonight and waiting so long. <laughs> Much appreciated. All good. Thank you. The next is community safety audits. Superintendent Fletcher and Christy Wood, community policing coordinator. Good evening and welcome. Your 
Worship Council, I would like to introduce Christy Wood. Oh, I left my notes on this side. Um, Ms. Christy Wood joined the Nanaimo RCMP in the summer of 2020 and quickly became engaged in a variety of our challenges. Ms. Woods has worked in the community policing and non-for-profit agencies uh, before joining us. She brings a wealth of experience in crime prevention through environmental design and drafting of grant proposals. Ms. Woods has worked uh, with the interns of VIU and Katimovic at the detachment and has brought forward new ideas in community engagement. Ms. Woods is the coordinator of our community policing volunteers and presently manages 44 of our community police volunteers, as well as the Harbor Patrol. This is the third presentation of the year on behalf of the RCMP, as the first focused on the RCMP perspective on the status of policing. Our second presentation with Mr. Dan Hurley was a comparative analysis of policing uh, within uh, Canada. And tonight's presentation by Ms. Woods is centered on the community safety audits to better inform us from the citizen's perspective on crime safety and policing in Nanaimo. Ms. Woods. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Ms. Wood, good evening and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Fletcher, and thank you, Your Worship, and fellow councillors for having me tonight to hear about our neighbourhood safety audits tonight. So I know we're short on time, and I think you guys received the individual reports in your agenda package. So I'm just going to provide highlights, and then I'm here to answer questions if you guys have any of that. So our safety audits uh, work to promote neighborhood safety by identifying factors that relate to crime and safety. And the audits really work to engage neighborhoods towards reducing opportunities of crime and just increasing the general well-being of the neighborhood. So safety audits will often incorporate residents, businesses' perspectives. We also uh, look at crime stats uh, for the particular area. And we will also use anecdotal information, whether that's in past interviews or past group focuses as well. And these uh, neighborhood safety audits were um, conducted in collaboration with our VIU criminology department, practicum students, because I'm only one person, so it's lovely to have them, and also working very closely with our neighborhood associations and our current block watches that we have. Go. So these are the six uh, neighborhoods that we identified uh, to work with in this first round. Um, and why these neighborhoods? We, we started to really look at neighborhoods that would really benefit from a neighborhood community safety audit. And we started to kind of look at maybe some of the vulnerable indicators that were happening. We're really lucky to have a crime analyst uh, within the Nanaimo RCMP. So we looked at what we call crime harm indexes, which really looks at the different types of crime and how they impact a community. Uh, and we also um, took a look at census data, although from 2016, but we looked at things like employment rates, you know, poverty rates, um, that sort of stuff in there. Um, and so through uh, identifying them, we tried to work within the census tracts that we had, um, and then also with existing neighborhood associations where there were some. The downtown uh, neighborhood was tricky in the sense that the census tract covered Old City Quarter and the downtown area. So we divided those into two just because of the uh, geographical area as well as some of the challenges that we're facing. So we had in total 746 businesses and residents directly engage um, in this project, whether through online survey or through our actual group physical audits. And usually our physical audits will actually have larger groups, but we did have to limit them to co because of COVID to, to 10. Uh, but we had many checklists that residents could go out with partners to, to, to follow the same route that we did with our group audits. So some of the questions that we asked in our online survey really uh, just looked to explore how people felt about their neighborhoods. And later on, I'll talk a little bit about um, feelings of safety. But here you can see um, that you know, people have a real sense of belonging to their neighborhood um, and they have pride of place in their neighborhood. And one of the questions we asked was, you know, would you recommend your neighbor, neighborhood to other people who might be moving into the area? And there was a high majority of people that did. You can see some more of those details um, in the reports themselves. Then we also asked about safety, so general levels of feelings of safety, uh, whether they thought crime rates had increased in their neighborhood and whether they thought that their neighborhood had more crimes than other neighborhoods. So you can see about half of the respondents were not happy with safety in their neighborhoods, with Brecken Hill kind of being on the higher end there, um, being the most dissatisfied. Uh, most neighborhoods also believe that crime was on the rise. 
And there was a little bit more variation when residents were asked to compare their neighborhoods to other neighborhoods, but you can kind of see the south end and the downtown all kind of thinking, uh, you know, being a little bit on the higher end about whether they thought they had more crime in their neighborhood. This is just an example of the table that you will find in the reports. Um, and we're really lucky to be able to have access to this data. We get it from our crime analyst. Um, and so it covers the five years as well as the first three months, uh, the first quarter of 2021. And what this da data comes from is what we call our unified uh, community response survey. And it's a tool that policing agencies use to measure incidences um, that are happening in the community. So in general, I'm not gonna go kind of into the, the depth of it, because you can kind of see that in the reports, but in general, our total number of incidences uh, reported to police have increased. And there's three, three kind of factors that we can kind of attribute to this. The first being that there is an increase in incidences. Um, the second being that more people are reporting incidences that they might not have reported before in the past. And the third is um, in 2019, there was a major shift in the methodology that the Unif uh, Uniform Crime response survey um, used. And so briefly, um, not to confuse things, but um, starting prior to 2019, any reports that were, in, uh, you know, reports of incidences to police that were made, uh, they had to be uh, proved through investigation in order to be collected in the stats. In 2019, they changed that to a victim-centered approach. So all incidences that reported were collected in the stats and only through investigation would they be able to be taken out of the stats if they were proved to not happen. So I know that was a lot, but so that definitely would automatically increase some of our, some of our stats there, but not all. Um, the other thing you'll notice um, just quickly on the crime stats is that you can see um, a sharp increase in our general occurrences and our suspicious occurrences. And those are more related to our public disorder events. Uh, so things like trespass, the Trespass Act, our well-being checks, uh, street, Safe Streets, uh, Quarantine Act, Lost Property. So that kind of covers um, kind of all of those um, things. And yeah, I highly recommend reading the reports because you'll see in each neighborhood, although there's some similarities, there's some differences for sure. So one of the questions we also asked was, you know, what did neighborhood uh, residents and businesses think would help? So as you know, and I'm sure you've heard, that neighborhoods are definitely feeling the impact of homelessness and the opioid crisis that we're facing right now. And they really are concerned about housing and the lack of uh, support services for mental health and, and treatment options. And the public disorder that's often attributed to these crises are increasing the fear in these neighborhoods. So some of the examples of what they thought would help, uh, definitely, like I mentioned, housing with mental health and treatment options. Uh, they talked a lot about reducing some of the poverty that they're seeing in their neighborhoods. They want to address uh, drug use as well as the prevalence of drug houses in some of the neighborhoods that the neighbors are witnessing. A lot of the neighborhoods had concerns about traffic safety especially in some of our neighborhoods that had uh, roads that were multi-jurisdictional, uh, so that was a challenge there. Uh, they wanted to see more proactive and problem-orientated policing, so they just, they want to build more relationship and they want to see police in their neighborhoods. They are looking for more crime prevention interventions um, and programming, and that kind of gets a little bit explored uh, in the report as well. And all neighborhoods across the board thought that mental health services needed to play a bigger role in community safety. So the reports um, that were drafted are really geared towards the neighborhoods because it's really important to engage the neighborhoods. The messaging that I often say, um, you know, it takes every single one of us to deal with community safety. It's not entirely the police responsibility. It's not entirely council's, like it's all of ours. And so that's the message um, that we really need to work together. And community services, um, community policing services, sorry, we're committed on supporting the neighborhoods um, with those recommendations, especially if they're buying into those recommendations. And of course, um, the other message I often say to the neighborhoods is that we're not gonna solve homelessness and we're not gonna solve the opioid crisis. So how do we work together to reduce the opportunities of crime in our neighborhood? 
So some of the recommendations that I'm working with on the neighborhood is just more cohesive uh, neighborhoods through neighborhood association, block watches, and more strong linkages to other agencies that are providing services in the neighborhood. So nonprofits like shelters or housing providers, they're offering services to our most marginalized citizens, um, and they need to be involved in the neighborhood context because they're providing services to residents in that neighborhood as well. So we need to kind of bring everybody together. And the relationships between you know, agencies and neighborhood associations and block watch is important because they'll better have an understanding of what everybody's challenge is on both sides um, and we'll be able to address them more co collaboratively. The other uh, element that we talk a lot about is um, working with improvement events. So uh, talking about neighborhood cleanups, you know, painting parties, covering graffiti, as you know, we, we have that as a problem, um, block watch parties. And so that will increase safety by beautifying and cleaning up the neighborhood, but also builds relationship with the residents. And that's an, an important factor. If you know your neighbors, that increases safety within the neighborhood. And we're committed to providing, I know um, Inspector, uh, sorry, Superintendent Fletcher, um, she mentioned about uh, the volunteer team we have who are really committed and they love helping out with these kinds of events. So it'd be great to, to get them and we're committed to help them with that. Uh, the other thing that we can do to support a lot of the neighbors, uh, neighborhoods is just some of the problematic um, properties um, and helping the owners address some of that stuff through crime prevention, through envi environmental design. So we can do large assessments where we look at large properties, um, look at crime stats and try to help take them within that neighborhood context, right down to helping the resident do a home security check, right? So those are the types of things that we can do to reduce opportunities for crime on their property, which will help the neighborhood overall. Uh, another thing that kind of came up uh, was confusion about who to call, when to call. There was a lot of confusion about when do I call police, when do I call bylaw, when do I call sanitation, for instance. And so I'm working with uh, the social planning department just to talk about how we can um, continue to build on the pamphlets that they've already created that are specific to the neighborhoods. And then I've got volunteers who are going to go out and canvas the neighborhood and drop this information off to them because not everybody uses the internet. Um, so that will provide more access to that information. And finally, uh, the last couple of programs that we already deliver uh, is our Crime Watch and our Speed Watch. So our Crime Watch uh, program is a program that our volunteers, trained volunteers run, and they go out in our community policing van. They act as the eyes and ears for the police and for the community, and they report all suspicious behavior. They also act as a general deterrent when they roll up in the community policing van. Um, and so we're gonna target those Crime Watch in those hotspots in those neighbors, uh, neighborhoods that were identified by the neighbors themselves. And our Speed Watch uh, is a program that we um, deliver with ICBC, and we're going to deploy those in our hotspot areas within those neighborhoods as well. And those are trained volunteers who operate a radar board, radar guns, and they act as a general deterrent again, educating motorists to slow down. But we also collect those stats and we give them to ICBC and we give them to our traffic unit if they um, are planning any enforcement activity, they can use that as a guide. The last section of reports really starts to talk a little bit deeper about opportunities for change. Um, and in the report, you'll see that uh, we talk a little bit about how crime is complex, and it stems a lot from the vulnerabilities that many people face um, and a lack of adequate access to social determinants of health for individuals and for, for communities as well. And it can be a really good educational tool uh, to start to talk about those complexities and start to talk about you know, what best practices are happening across the country with our citizens um, and people who are living in these neighborhoods as well, especially around crime prevention uh, programs and other similar initiatives. So uh, some of the work is just uh, having neighborhoods support the work of the Homelessness Coalition and creating relationships between the neighbors and coalition. And I think that this will uh, garner more support for the coalition, but also help tackle some of those that stigma and the myths that sometimes happen around some of that work. Uh, the linkages with traffic safety, and just like I mentioned, the multiple jurisdictions, um, linking them up with um, agencies and committees such as our own Nanaimo Road Safety Committee that has multiple jurisdictions sitting on there. So bringing that information to them as well. 
Another area that our neighborhoods are facing challenges around are vacant properties and laneways. So one of the one of the neighborhoods that we did an audit in had seven really large vacant lots right on our route. Um, and the neighbors talked about the challenges that those lots uh, presenting. And research is showing the correlation between uh, hyper vacancy, what they're calling, and what levels of safety are happening in that neighborhood. Uh, so some municipalities in the states, for instance, have a use it or lose it bylaw, where after a certain amount of time, if the property owner isn't able to upkeep it, they take it into their municipal coffers and they build affordable housing or they build a park or they build a community garden, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, the other uh, thing that I mentioned earlier was just about um, proactive policing. So 85% of our survey respondents indicate that policing play a major role in crime prevention um, and they want to see the presence of police. They want to get to know the police officers. They want to build a relationship with them, not only to respond to calls, but to know who they are and build and, and have them proactively in their neighborhood. And in Nanaimo, I'm sure you know, um, our police officers carry some of the most highest case loads. Um, and our general duty section sometimes has trouble meeting some of their staffing levels that are required. So there's there really is no time for any of this proactive policing uh, that the citizens of Nanaimo want to see. Another uh, area of focus is the stigma that some of our neighborhoods are facing. And uh, I remember um, having the honor of meeting a university student who uh, was raised here in Nanaimo and said he had only gone downtown a handful of times because he was always told it was a, a scary place to be. You know, that actually perpetuates a huge issue for us, not only economically, but if we don't have positive activity happening in our downtown area, that is actually going to increase opportunities for crime. So we need to address that stigma uh, in our neighborhoods and get people outside and enjoying that. We also need more work upstream. Um, one of the neighborhoods that we were um, talking with residents about is they're really concerned about their youth, their youth at risk. And so we need to start looking more at crime prevention programs that you know, look at circumstances like adverse childhood effects uh, or childhood poverty, because those have direct link to whether they will grow up and be part of the criminal justice system in that way. So we need to kind of focus on some of those and bring some of those more initiatives and support our nonprofit agencies to do that work as well well. So where do we go from here? So currently I'm working with uh, quite a few of the neighborhoods. They're in support of, uh, they feel like I've captured their voice um, in, in the audits. Um, and with the other neighborhoods, I'm working on getting you know, support and just making sure that they are engaged with the recommendations. I'm here sharing the report with you and I'm hoping to share it with other decision makers as well as other agencies. And I'm hoping to go back to these neighborhoods in two to three year time and just actually see you know, uh, what the level of safety feeling is you know, a few years down the road and has anything made a difference. And finally, I'm hoping that I can uh, convince the VIU criminology department uh, to help me out again with their practicum students and, and hit some other neighborhoods um, probably in the winter of 2022 because we've had a huge response from other neighborhoods who want to take part in this work. So hopefully I, I made it in time. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. That was a very fulsome presentation and a, a broad topic, as we're all aware. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Armstrong and then Councillor Martin. I think I have two questions. The first one is I didn't see any crimes against persons on your list. Is there a reason why that was not there? On the tables? Yeah, there's no uh, assaults, there's no sexual assaults, any of yeah, that? Yeah, um, th th that information was just more about focusing on the neighborhoods, what's actually visible and happening outside in the community. And just the reason I say that is, is I get regular emails from different people in the community, we were assaulted again, we were assaulted again. Mm -hmm. So I, personally, myself, I would like to see that captured at a later date because I think it's really important. Uh, I just got one this weekend where they actually took a videotape of two young boys being attacked by a homeless person with needles. So. Right. And they didn't want to call the police because they're, they haven't had a good response time based out of Courtney, I think, where they're on hold for a certain period of time. So I know that's out of your control, but I think that's something we need to discuss at a later date. And then my second, second point is, is um, having been around this world for a long time, none of this is new. It's, I mean, we've been dealing with this since the 80s. So how are we going to change it? I mean, in order to, us to, to, to move anything forward, it's going to take, you know, I would guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent Fletcher, at least another influx of at least 15 more more police officers just to deal with your your normal response times and then if you want to do the proactive stuff you know we all know the first thing that goes is proactive policing because they need to be responding to calls so 
Is that something that's going to be discussed at a later date as to how this council can support you in that? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship, through Councillor Armstrong. Um, the purpose of today's presentation is to provide information uh, to the council, and that is the intent of today. Um, there are other uh, processes at place um, where uh, business cases can be considered. Um, the purpose for today was to provide information to the council as to what the citizens within the community are experiencing uh, recognizing that there are other points down the road um, regardless of what happens uh, in terms of business cases um, we'll also be taking the input that we can and using it in ways that we have the ability to to try and improve our service delivery to the community examples include the uh, coordinated traffic service um, and other ways which we can leverage the resources that we do have. Um, but obviously moving forward, we would love every opportunity to continue to build and connect with uh, community agencies as well as improving our staffing levels. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for your report. It was very good and, and very in-depth. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Councillor Martman. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, uh, thank you for a very comprehensive report. Um, I have a question, like for instance, on the Nanaimo neighborhood safety audits, which was on the PowerPoint presentation, I believe it focuses on the downtown. What surprised me was, um, for instance, it said in 2020, break and enters into a residence was one. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm surprised and I'm happy that these numbers are quite low but it surprises me because it says five bike thefts and I'm on Facebook and social media and I'm hearing bike thefts constantly. Now I know it's not just in the downtown area, but I'm wondering are they underreported or is this true or are we imagining things and reality is much better than our perception? Through your worship. Um, I think that you've, you've hit the nail on the head on, on a couple of those issues is that, uh, yes, sometimes we don't get those reports, so they're not reflected. And sometimes, um, you know, the idea, and we, we have social media to thank for that, sometimes the numbers are, you know, um, ballooned in, in the sense that they're not actually there. So I think that, you know, sometimes, especially when you're looking at some of the later stats, um, you know, definitely I think COVID has played an impact on some of that. And you can kind of see that in some of the neighborhoods, especially around businesses, um, where some of the break-in um, enters, uh, or, or sorry, in residences are lower because people were at home more. Right. So um, those things, it's, it's so hard. It's a big social experiment because you can't really say where the answer is coming from. And that's why we try to collect stats from all these different sources to try to paint a picture of what we know to understand to be true from different sources. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship, and through you to um, both uh, folks. And hi, the last time I was met, I was in your office, and now you're in mine. How about that? Hi. <laughs> um, in the categories, I'm looking at the tables right now, five main categories seem to be skewing the results or, or driving up the numbers, and those are cause disturbance, mischief to property, municipal bylaw, other general occurrences, and suspicious occurrences. What percentage of those become a crime, approximately? Uh, uh, Your Worship, uh, through you. Um, you're right in that many of those become uh, reported to police, but not necessarily um, a criminal offense. And um, they do keep us very busy. And the challenge is sometimes the timeliness of solving some of the matters that um, truly aren't criminal in nature, but now that we have been given carriage of it, we have a responsibility to try and see it through to the end. Um, so some of those, for example, uh, relate to addiction issues. People are acting in a way that is highly unusual and it causes the concern of the citizens that report it. Then it's a determination of the person's wellness and where should they best be. Um, likewise, with disturbances, um, we spend a lot of time looking for things that, because of time delays or the information, 
aren't readily apparent um, on first blush and then uh, need to be investigated. So um, there is definitely uh, an increase in that. And we also see within communities, um, how do I put it? a greater sensitivity as well as people become concerned about their safety, an increase in reporting of some instances that previously they may not have reported. Um, we've seen that, for example, in communities where they are noticing um, a lot more transitory traffic um, and increased reporting in property crimes where maybe previously they wouldn't have reported um, minor items going missing, but in an effort to try and help the community, they're reporting all instances. Um, so it changes demographics, and I think there's a lot of quotes around stats, um, but at the same time, um, the purpose in providing this information today is to um, also capture within it the essence of what the communities are experiencing. Um, and it goes beyond the stats uh, to what they are, are daily living through their communities. Does Thank that you. answer I'm, your question, sir? I'm, I'm, by, when you're saying that, we're encouraging people to call, like to Councillor Martman's point about the bike theft. I'm going to, why would we not be reporting bike thefts yet we report people who just walk down the street and seem to be yelling at themselves? So I'm, I'm going to guess that these stats are actually fairly accurate in terms of obviously like you've got them from somewhere. Um, and, and I do recognize the increase. I think these five categories that I've mentioned would probably all be considered to be issues that arise from people who are homeless and on the streets and have mental health issues. Um, so I did have a question of why no violent crimes in here, but I think you've answered that. Um, Specifically to Brecken Hill, and in your initial and in your initial screens there, you said Brecken Hill people are the most feel the most unsafe in their neighborhood. But when we actually go to the Brecken Hill stats, they are the least dangerous place to live. So what, like in terms of like their stats are literally a quarter, if not more, compared to what is downtown. Um, and so we have this belief in the neighborhoods that it's unsafe when the reality is it's not, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, there's not much of a question there. Is, 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 this causes, uh, I think, problems as, as when you did release the report, the newspapers are picked up, everybody's afraid to go out of their houses at night and during the day and everything else, and it's actually not the case. Um, in, in Newcastle, I think it's around 47% of the people or even more believe that they're going to get broken into in the next year. And there's like 800 people in the 800 homes in that area, which would mean roughly 400 are going to get broken into. Yet last year there was two and it was down from the year before. So this, this perception of being unsafe is basically a perception. Now, I'm probably going to get quoted newspapers all over the place on this, but to me, we have a problem here of communication. It's not, and not so much thing. Because if I look at the downtown stats, and arson is at the same level as it was in 2019, auto theft is down, bike theft is down, break and enter's business is down, break and enter other is down, break and enter residential is down to one from six, counterfeits even down, frauds are down. Mischief to property is up, because it's one of these mischiefs run. Municipal bylaw up, other go is up, and then everything else is down. It's actually less criminal in our downtown area in 2020 than it was in 2019. Yet the numbers are going up because of these issues that have to do with people who are homeless. And so if we had $2 million to give to the RCMP, and we could either hire police officers or we could build shelters and provide services to the homeless in our city, which would you rather see done? <laughs> I, I, I'm tempted to give the superintendent the opportunity not to answer that okay. question, but, but I, I will I'll, I'll answer the question differently. Um, <laughs> I'll, 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 sorry. No, no. I'm going to, I'm going to state the question differently. So if we had $2 million to spend and we could spend it on additional police forces 
or on some of the suggestions that you've made in your report, or we could spend it on shelter and providing services to people who are homeless. Would these three, five categories, in your estimation, go down? Wow, through your worship. Um, that, uh, when I'm thinking of police resources and their cost relative to housing, um, I don't think they're comparable and that it would take, you're right, it would take, police don't solve housing and they don't solve addiction issues. And so using police to solve those issues doesn't work. Um, where police do have the ability to make a difference is in the crime prevention component and the investigation of offenses that have happened. But they don't um, work effective, or I'm sorry, that's not the correct way of putting it. Um, they're not best suited for um, the economic and mental health issues that um, our community is experiencing as a way of prevention. That's not their focus. Sorry, that's not really worded correctly, but I'm trying to um, address what you're saying at the center of it is, is there value in putting uh, resources into uh, preventative processes? And I completely agree with you on that in terms of housing and treatment processes for those who suffer from addiction. There is huge value in that, without a doubt. And I think there, um, it's challenging for your role um, as counselors to make a determination between competing interests. I very much understand that. And mm -hmm. um, so this, I'm going to start getting political now as opposed to, I'm, not, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there. But, um, <laughs> Um, I believe that this council has made some decisions in the past regarding extra um, security forces in the downtown area, which has never been even mentioned in your report as people looking for that. Um, and we should have been spending that money on preventative measures and helping people who are homeless. Because the money that we spent on security guards, I'm looking at, the downtown stats, and all the things that you would normally have a security guard doing, those all went up, and the crime went down, like it's similar in other areas. And I'll give you what, Harewood is up on a number of things, the South End is up on a number of things. Uh, the Old City Quarter, again, most of them are heading down, the crimes that are listed. So I think this council needs to say, where do we want to spend our money? Where can we actually make a difference? And so this is what I hope that will come out of this report, recognizing that what we've done in the past hasn't worked, the stats are right here in front of us, and that maybe we should start looking at something else. Um, also, um, our, our failure to communicate to the public about the safety within their neighborhoods, I think is also something that we really need to look at. I, I love this city. I'm, I'm quite happy in where it's going. I'm not happy with some of the issues in this city. But I do know that it is a relatively safe place to live in and not what people think some of there are. So thank you, Facebook, for all of that. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Worship. There isn't a question at the end of this. <laughs> no, I would just be being political. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Bonner. Councillor Thorpe. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. I had a question 10 minutes ago, but <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten it now after, after listening to Councillor Bonner's solutions, <laughs> um, which I disagree with totally. And if I had $2 million, I would start by putting it into greater enforcement and crime prevention programs. So there's my answer to the question. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're talking about here, obviously, as it says on the screen, is feelings of safety, perceptions of safety. And I don't care if it's reality, if it's a perception, it's a perception. And if people are feeling unsafe in their neighborhoods, just simply pointing to the fact that there haven't been as many bike crimes lately, or bikes stolen, that doesn't help the perception. So that's what I'm interested in. and. Um, to say to somebody, oh, well, don't worry, uh, we're, we're putting a, 
homeless shelter in your neighborhood, so that'll solve the problems and you can all feel safer. I, I don't think neighborhoods are going to buy that either without an argument, and I don't blame them. So, but that's all distraction from what I originally wanted to ask about, and that is uh, and through you, Your Worship, through uh, to Superintendent Fletcher and Ms. Wood. Aside from having money to put more boots on the ground and a, an increased police presence, which would cause people to feel safer, um, am I correct in saying that what I'm getting out of this is one of the most important um, connections could be the connection of the police department with the neighborhood associations and working together with them to look at ways to uh, prevent or minimize crimes. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I guess I'm thinking ahead to other items on our coming agendas regarding neighborhood associations and the role that they have to play and organizations within the neighborhood, such as Crime Watch, Block Watch, Citizens on Patrol, whatever, all of those sort of proactive community-based programs. Is it fair to say that those are going to play an important role uh, in doing what we can to allay the perception, the real perception, that neighborhoods to some extent are unsafe? And maybe that's due to the homeless population, um, I wouldn't dispute that, but whatever's causing it, we need to do whatever we can to abate it. So I think I had a question in there, and it was to do with the importance of neighborhood associations and how they can help us. Uh, through your worship, uh, to Councillor Thorpe. Um, you touched on something that I wanted to speak to, uh, one of the pieces that uh, Ms. Woods has worked on, and that was working with the communities in advance of them receiving the new supportive housing and some of the uh, information that she provided that informed people better, talked about crime prevention through environmental design, and as well the ongoing work that um, she's engaging in with that community as they move forward. And I think that's a real strong initiative that we can replicate um, going forward that we didn't have the opportunity to do in the same way in the past. And I think that there's real benefit with that. And as more people are engaged within their community, it does drop negative per, uh, perceptions as well as increase familiarity, which we, we know can help people feel more secure. Um, and I'm gonna let Ms. Woods uh, provide context to that as well. Thank you, through your worship. I, I think you, you know, uh, nailed it on the head in the sense that uh, that is, you know, some of the intention of this work is to try to work at a neighborhood level to improve community safety because I think, you know, everybody's feeling overwhelmed, everybody's feeling frustrated and, and feeling helpless. And part of this is to, you know, talk about how we can, you know, remove those feelings and work at the neighborhood level. And so we are working with the neighborhood associations, um, getting them involved. I mean, we have some amazing neighborhood associations that are already doing some amazing work. I can think of SICA, you know, the South End Community Association. They're doing amazing stuff in their community. They just need more support and I'm, and I'm here to support them um, in that way, connect them to, you you know, existing block watches and try to connect them with the agencies that are providing service um, in that area because it kind of reminds me of that you know good old face to face you know I think that's how we're going to get over the social media perception right if, if we have those face to face I know it's tough with COVID but you know getting out there talking to people sharing information and like you said communicating, you know, providing that education. And I think that's the work that the community policing services can do with the neighborhood associations and the block watches and the nonprofits as well, providing services and the businesses as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate the report, which I found very interesting. And I think I'm confident that council will have some interesting discussions as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I'm not going to get into the big debate. I'll wait for another day. My question is going to, for the, the who to and when to call, is there going to be a public education campaign on that, number one? And number two, I myself, when I, I called the non-emergency line, waited for 25 minutes, then got fed up and hung up. Is, can something be done about that, or is that where you want to encourage the use of the um, online complaint system? Uh, through your worship, if I may. Um, 
Yes, we are working on that uh, in twofold. One, um, recognizing that not everyone uses computers, um, so looking at uh, alternatives to that, as well as complementing what we have on the RCMP page as well as the city page. And I was looking at those today uh, in preparation for this presentation. And they aren't easy to navigate to know exactly where you want to go. And I think we can do a lot to make that um, an easier um, interface with the public on where they need to go. Um, and that's something that I want to commit to working for, working on as we move forward. Um, and I think the advantage to that is if people can go um, directly to the agency that they need in the first instance, it reduces frustration and it reduces the extra load on the alternate service, right? If you are in the right queue at the right time, it's better for everyone. And so that's something we need to work on. Um, it, there's challenges as with everything, but it is something that I think we can make some progress on in fairly quick order. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hemmons and Councillor Gesselbrock and Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you for the presentation. I'm curious, you just noted that some communities or neighborhoods are already doing great things. You, you noted the South End. Is this an opportunity to share amongst the neighborhood networks those good things that are happening so we're not duplicating efforts or you know reinventing the wheel as we go? Yeah, through Your Worship. Uh, thank you. That's a really good question. I think I actually mentioned it um, possibly in the Old City Quarter report where I talk about how neighborhood associations should start linking up and, and talking about what's working. Um, you know, I know the Old City Quarter does a great, um, you know, twice a year they do a big neighborhood cleanup and they go through this whole process. And I think that that information would be really good for other neighborhood associations. So that is uh, one of the efforts that I'm trying to help connect them with. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship, uh, through you. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, just uh, in this process of, of doing the audit, w audits, uh, speaking with the neighborhood associations and, and doing the survey, um, did you feel that it strengthened the relationship between the community to p policing and the neighborhood associations and that that can kind of be used further uh, so that there's direct line of communication when there is questions and I was just thinking also you, if neighborhood associations do have concerns around safety that they're able to check in and maybe get more live data on what's been going on and what's being reported to sort of uh, help with that per perception between what's what's the feeling and, 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 and what's happening in terms of uh, the stats. Mm -hmm. Through your worship. Um, that's a really good question. We, we are already doing that work uh, in that sense. We, um, Constable Brian and I, uh, go out all the time to speak to neighborhoods, provide education and awareness. Uh, you know, we, for instance, we had um, a break in. Uh, we went right away and just walked around the property uh, with the building manager and, and talked to them about how they might be able to improve security, um, how they might improve natural surveillance on their property. So we're doing a lot of that stuff. And, and as we go out, we are also, um, you know, looking at what the actual crime stats are for that property. So another property that reached out to us, you know, really wanted to know how they could improve, um, you know, safety on their property, but they didn't know what they were dealing with because you know we're even confused sometimes you know are the stats real you know is social media real um, and so for them who aren't used to this um, constable Brian and I can go out and we can talk to them about you know what's being reported what we're hearing from other police officers what we're hearing from other neighborhoods because they're reaching out to us as well so it's it's a great communication uh, piece that we're hoping to continue to build on great thank you and just a follow-up um, you know I we're going through a process where we're reviewing our our neighborhood associations and the neighborhood network and um you know i, I see a few members uh here uh you know that are part of those <clears throat> associations and network um you know if there's any recommendations of how the city can strengthen uh that the neighborhood associations and, and network and, and how it connects with the community policing that's something that you know we'd like to hear more on uh, as we go through the process through our official community plan to maybe establish something that can uh, be uh, as you know as, fec as effective as it could be mm -hmm. 
Yeah, through your worship. I think uh, that that would be wonderful for us to support that work um, because, you know, we are a service in the community and we'd love to be able to, um, you know, build more cohesiveness and provide that link as well. Great. Thank you. Councillor Brown and Councillor Armstrong again. Uh, thank you, Worship, and uh, thank you for the presentation. So I think the comments from Councillor Thorpe and Councillor Bonner are, are kind of interesting to me in relation to the report because I don't want to discount perception at all. I think perception is that fundamentally important how people interact with space. But I do also note that I've been to many places in the world that have high policing presence, high security presence, and I didn't feel any safer. Um, and so that the gap here between maybe what some of the statistics are showing you know, it could indicate a few things, but two things that sort of stands out to me is it either indicates that there is an underreporting for whatever reason, loss of confidence in the reporting system, how it's dealt with, et cetera, et cetera, or that people's perceptions doesn't necessarily match what the data is telling us. Both are very interesting, but I think they both trigger different policy responses. So if we are to make decisions, how do we, and that's why I think the dichotomy uh, sort of represented here is interesting because Ultimately, we do have to make policy decisions with limited resources, um, or at least resource considerations. So how do we navigate this moving forward? Are we able to drill down further and figure out where the gap is? And if not, then how do we sort of balance that and chart a path forward? Right. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Brown, um, I'm gonna let Ms. Wood answer to that as well. I agree with you that there are challenges in interpreting it. And I think we all lived through uh, the downtown, for example, during COVID in that um, the crime stats were exceptionally low in the downtown core during that lockdown period of March. And yet people um, maybe had a, a sense of unease because it was also so quiet. So there's a, a perfect example of what you just said. It was exceptionally safe. There was nothing happening and yet people had a sense of unease. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to figure out is how do we um, work with letting the community know that we do have a wonderful community. Um, and at the same time, there are some challenges and there are some benefits and that oftentimes people um, over exaggerate the things that, that they are fearful of and they see them everywhere they look and you know ignore other pieces that they don't find alarming and it does change our reporting habits right people may anticipate um, a piece of property being stolen that's high value and left out and about such as a bike um, and they aren't as alarmed by that where uh, a violent person offense um, causes a lot of calls um, for for their what they perceive that to be and so there are challenges with that um, Ms. Wood, do you have anything further you want to add through, on perception? Through your worship. Uh, I'm not sure that they have to be competing issues, I guess. I think they both warrant um, much needed attention, you know, from, you know, the housing, uh, you know, um, and our mental health crisis, you know, down to proactive policing. I think that uh, crime is, you know, very complex and we need multi pronged approach. So you've got your, you know, primary crime prevention, but we've got our upstream stuff, you know, which is what Councillor Bonner is talking about in a lot of ways. So I, I'm not sure that they're competing. And I, you know, you guys are on the political side. I'm over here. Um, but uh, I think that they're both uh, very important. If I may follow up. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they're competing. I'm just su suggesting that ultimately decisions have to be made in response. And so how do we best determine how we allocate resources to the response and, and you know I, I don't expect an answer but uh, you know when you look at this data and you know there was a presentation a few weeks ago you know that that was a really nice one because it was a little more clear right and so um all those are inputs and i'm just sort of maybe it's just musings but sort of acting asking for a more collective musing on how do we navigate this to ultimately implement some sort of policy response we don't have to have the answer today but in a couple months Ultimately, we do as we talk about resource allocation through the budget. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I may, Your Worship, um, we are now members of the Canadian Municipal Crime Network on Crime Prevention. The city is, and Nanaimo is, and they're grappling with your with what you're grappling. Um, and they are, you know, there's best practices across the country that we can start to look at. Um, and I think, you know, I just recommend that you guys take a look at their website. Uh, we have access to 
you know, community safety practitioners across Canada. Um, and, you know, this might be an opportunity. There's decision makers that sit on that network and they're grappling with the same, this, the same struggles that you are. Um, and it would be great to tap into those resources. Councillor Armstrong. I just wanted to say to Council Gesselbrecht's question, Block Watch is one of those programs that does what you're saying. I don't think that was mentioned. It's one of the, uh, Constable O'Brien took it from six, six Block Watches in 2016 to probably well over 60, 70 now. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, so that's, that's a program that is probably more effective than a neighborhood association. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this tonight, and I appreciate uh, very much that this report was delivered for very specific reasons. Um, I, I must tell you what I draw out of it is, uh, to some extent, what Councillor Thorpe has had to say. Uh, and I, Councillor Bonner is right. The way we're really going to fix this is if all of those other issues are solved, we just disagree about who should pay for it. Um, one does get the sense that the perception of crime and the level of fear in the community directly relates to that not the homeless population in the broad sense but those who exhibit behaviors consistent with mental health addictions and brain injury my old hobby horse forgive me for saying it over and over again but the most frightening cases and people feel uncomfortable in public places in their neighborhoods when they see people who are clearly uh, in a state of human misery uh, and until that gets fixed, um, I, I think what you're attempting to achieve and are working to achieve with the neighborhood uh, associations is very positive. Uh, it builds community, it builds a sense of security. So thank you very much for what you're doing. I do appreciate it. Mr. McGrath, um, we usually have a break at nine o'clock, but you've been waiting patiently. And I'm going to suggest that we have you as your delegation now, and then we'll take a recess after that unless I see great objection from council. Before you start, thank you for uh, sending the email last week to outline uh, what you were hoping to achieve tonight. That is appreciated. You have five minutes, as you know, and at four minutes I will uh, indicate to you have a minute left. Well, City Council, good thank evening. Uh, the, neighbor, the Nanaimo Neighborhood Network, the NNN, is the umbrella organization for the 22 plus neighborhood associations and groups located in Nanaimo. At a recent meeting of the members, we heard from our RCMP guests, uh, Constable O'Brien and uh, Community Policing Coordinator Christy Wood on the final reports of their six safety audits. It's not just the downtown, it's all six neighborhoods. Uh, when it comes to our city, there are few, if any, issues more important than the safety and security of our citizens. The Nanaimo Neighborhood Network supports the essence of these reports and support the RCMP and the city in bringing and presenting these reports to Sheila Malcolmson, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. The municipalities of British Columbia are facing a major crisis in the mental health and the substance abuse problems. This crisis is making a huge impact on the physical and emotional well-being of our citizens. Citizens are feeling less secure, less safe, threatened more in our cities. Citizens have nowhere to turn, so they turn to the police. The police are then tasked with dealing with these mental health and substance problems. They are not equipped financially or trained to be mental health specialists. Yet the RCMP respond, they seem to be the only ones responding. 400 plus times every month. Now the neighborhood network and its 22 neighborhood associations and groups are requesting two things. One, that the city put forward a motion today supporting the RCMP community policing team in securing a meeting with MLA Sheila Malcolmson and to present a safety audit report and request a solution. Two, the council direct staff to engage with the union of BC municipalities 
UBCM to engage the province on resolving the issues on how 911 calls can be routed and responded to by the mental health specialists, whether the police or the ministry, but through the province. The Nanaimo Neighborhood Network would be pleased to offer ideas, but it's the responsibility of the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. Vancouver has one plan, Surrey has another, and Toronto has another. We need an immediate short-term plan as well as a long-term solution. Now, I'll get on my political horse, I'm sure, Mr. Bonner, that the citizens of Nanaimo will be thrilled when you tell them they're wrong, that they feel what they feel is incorrect and how they feel and what they think is wrong because you got a number. I don't think that's the case. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. McGrath. Any questions for the delegation? Hearing none, thank you. And we have your letter of request from last week. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Gurry. Your Worship, um, there is one more delegation unrelated to agenda items that's after this um, regular council business. So um, I do suggest we do have a recess, um, a quick break before the rest of the meeting. But I suggest possibly we wait until after item 11A, Sherry um, Durnford, and then have our recess after that if council is amenable. She's been uh, waiting you, all you've evening. You've got committee minutes that require yeah. nothing there on the agenda. If someone gives me a motion for adoption of the consent items, moved Councillor Brown, seconded Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we'll let Ms. Dernford speak on two lane asphalt walkways and departure bay shoreline. Five minutes. Ms. Dernford, you'll introduce yourself when you get to the mic. And at four minutes, <laughs> don't rush. I'm not going to jump start, the, put you at the starting gate until you've arrived. I oh, appreciate you you're working with three legs tonight, so to speak. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much um, for um, allowing us to speak this evening about the Departure Bay um, walkway. And uh, just very quickly, has anyone had an opportunity to walk between the ferry terminal and and the Kin Park. Anybody? A thousand years Good to ago. Hear. Good to hear. Um, what we are concerned about is um, we, we feel that we could save actually you and staff and consultants a lot of time um, if we look at what some of the implications of an asphalt walkway are going to be. So um, from an ecological perspective, we're very concerned because there's a lot of land and marine life um, that depends on that um, shoreline. At, um, and that includes all sorts of bird species and um, mammals, um, herring and whales and, and a lot of fish. And, and we just are kind of concerned that an asphalt walkway would actually greatly impact their habitat. Um, we're also concerned about the erosion acceleration, um, maybe not from the walkway itself, but from people going off the walkway and trying to get up cliffs and so on. And in the picture shown there, it's not that distinct, but you can see the high tide line is right at where those logs are, and it's just below a clay cliff. So um, the walkway, uh, the walkway would have to, in some cases, actually go above um, where the um, where the uh, clay cliff is at this time, if you wanted to have it above the high tide line. Um, I think that the City of Nanaimo's Green Initiatives website has an excellent quote there. It says, "Riparian areas are also also help protect property from flooding and potential loss of land from channel erosion and instability. And I think that your, your websites um, for green initiatives really speak well um, in favor of not having an asphalt walkway in that particular area of your, um, of your proposed walkways. 
Uh, we also have to look at climate change. Um, we're just starting to see some of the implications of climate change. And we're looking at increased water levels. We're looking at increased water temperatures that further stress marine life. We're, uh, the heat wave last year, was last summer, was an excellent example of how millions of shellfish died due to um, some of the impacts of climate change. And building this man-made structure over the natural shoreline will even further stress an already precarious marine life. Um, just looking at the appeal, so many people now, the trend is for people to go towards natural settings now. We're getting away more from, way from sedentary developed infrastructure and more towards a natural setting. And that has been um, increased with the COVID-19 social distancing requirements and so on. So if you look at the left side, you'll see um, a natural shoreline that we have right now. If you look at the right side, which is your proposed walkway that's coming off your website, um, it completely destroys that natural shoreline. Also, there is a government of BC um, audit that was done a few years ago, and we'd be happy to give you copies of that, which show how precarious our shorelines on the east coast of Vancouver Island are and how in jeopardy they are. Um, so we're also looking at, of course, legal hurdles, and of which you're well aware of that the riparian rights um, are down to the shoreline, so the property owners would have to be um, consulted with this, and, and you'd have to have their buy-in. One minute. Also on the bluffs. Okay, thanks. And also on the bluffs, um, further erosion could um, result in a major remedial work. I won't go through approvals and consultations. I think staff did a really good job of putting together a good list of all of the approvals and consultations you'll need. I just added First Nations consultations because I'm sure you'll want to be doing that. And just looking at a couple of pictures of what the shoreline looks like now and how dependent um, bird species and mammals are on this shoreline. Um, there's oysters, clams, um, sand dollars, all sorts of things. Also, the safety concerns. So we've got strong southeast winds. When they come in, they go right on to that shoreline that you're looking at. Um, this would, if there was a walkway there, we would have to have it closed. You'd have to have staff regulating it and so on. Um, any tree removal would also further um, cause instability of the banks. And also, of course, uh, if you talk to Parksville City Council, they'll tell you about how fires, um, people like to have fires on those public accesses Just that they have. If you could wrap financial, up. Financial implications? Past your five minutes. Oh. If you could wrap up, please. One minute? Okay. Um, no, no, you, as, you, you're past your five minutes. That oh, was the that's it? earlier. If you could wrap up, please. Oh, okay. And I just wanted to also say from a financial implication, I'm a chartered professional accountant myself, and I look at the $35 million that it's going to cost you for that short length, and I know you've got a lot of priorities, and um, please consider um, your other priorities in consultation, just as you've been talking about earlier on tonight, should we put our, our money, where should we be putting our money? And I believe that... Th thank you, I think okay. you have your point, but okay. just hang on, uh, please, sorry. Councillor, no? Any questions for the delegation? No. Thank you very much, appreciate your patience tonight. Okay, and if anybody wants to have a tour, we'd be happy to give you Peter and Sherry at gmail.com. Please just give us an email and we'd be happy to take you on a tour of it. Thank you very much. Ms. Gurry, 10, 10 minute recess, please. The night is still young.
This is the 2018 redux of the lighting at Nanaimo's historic bastion. I've had the pleasure of being part of the relighting project on this amazing building in downtown Nanaimo. So what we did is we've replaced the original high pressure sodium lights, which basically did an okay job of lighting up the bottom 10 feet of the building and replaced them with modern LED lighting that has the capacity to change color. We can run through a number of different colors that we have pre-programmed here in a pink, a purple, a green. Uh, probably my favorite on here is Rainbow Chase for Pride Week. It's, uh, it'll actually run all the way around the building all the time. With this new technology, organizations can now request that the bastion be lit to promote their cause by going to the City Nanama website and following the instructions. Go to Your Government, Bastion Lighting Requests, complete the Lighting Request form, and submit. You will hear from us within a couple days if your request has been approved and the Bastion will be lit in the colors that you have requested. If you have any questions, please contact the Mayor's Office at 250-755-4400. So the next time you're in downtown Nanaimo at night, come on and check out the new dynamic lighting at The Bastion. Hey, Tiana. Hey. This sure is the coldest rink in town. <laughs> Wow, your goalie is keeping you guys in the game. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, oh, oh man, that's hot. Sorry, that's the way I like it. Oh. Go, 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 go. Penalty shot. Scalds from hot drinks are a leading cause of hospitalization for children under five. Two minutes, stand in the front, unsportsmanlike conduct. Hot tea and coffee will cause serious burns to a child in less than a second. Got a kid? Use the lid. What we have here is the real ice technology that was installed at the Nanaimo Ice Centre. It uh, allows us to use cold water from traditionally hot water that we used to use for making ice. Basically, the water will come in through the bottom, go in through a vortex idea, uh, making the air bubbles microscopic in size, which makes a better, more dense sheet of ice. Differences that you'll see with the real ice is there's less snow developed, so uh, that's easier for cleaning, and also it's a denser, harder, clear ice. So the ice skaters will certainly enjoy that. And the city plans to uh, implement real ice at our other two arenas as well. Some of the other efficiencies we've implemented in this facility are LED lights in some areas, and we've also, in the last few years, installed a higher efficiency refrigeration system, which lowers our energy costs. Both Sambonis at our facility are now electrically operated, so there's no harmful emissions, and uh, they're very quiet as well. So what this means for the city is that we're able to use less energy and also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more beneficial to the environment.
welcome to the city's South Fork Water Treatment Plant. This is where we take water that we would collect in our lakes and rivers, pipe it, we filter it and treat it before we send it off to the city's distribution system in your taps. This facility actually does a better job than most home filtration systems. The water that comes into your home that you use every day, that you bathe in every day, that you wash your clothes in every day, is cleaner than anything you can get anywhere. Here you see filtration in action. It's kind of like watching paint dry. There's nothing to really see. But if you look in the tank, you'll see the froth on the top. That's the dissolved organic matter, and when we aerate the tank, that froths up, and that's why that's up there. We take all the little particles, all the organic matter, any insects or bugs that might be in the water, and pathogens that we're trying to filter out, they're all gone. We filter the water using a series of membranes. So what we're looking at here is a membrane filtration module. So when I talk about the membranes filtering the water, this is what we're filtering the water with. And while you might think that the water flows through like the baleen of a whale, it's not true. These are hollow fiber membranes. So each of these little tiny strands are hollow, just like a shoelace and the membrane is wrapped around the outside of these tiny little hollow fibers. So these sit in a bath of water, raw water, and then we pull the water through the wall of the straw or the shoelace, and then it travels along and it collects in this vessel at the end here. And this hole at the end is where we pull the water out. And the membranes are like a, an almost impermeable waterproof layer that we pull the water through. So now we're just left with clean, pure drinking water. Take care. You are looking at Unit 400 from the City of Nanaimo Public Works Department. This truck is called our paint truck. It puts down most of the center line in the City of Nanaimo. Right now on the back, we have Holly. Today she is in charge of keeping the line straight. She can move the wheel back and forth, right or left, which controls this paint gun. And then right behind the paint system, there's a glass beads that are dispensed onto the fresh wet paint for retro reflectivity at night. The painted lines can last one or two years. Most center lines in Nanaimo are painted every year. Um, the white crosswalks and stop bars in thermoplastic can last anywhere from two to seven years, depending on traffic flow. And on the back here, Derek will be kind enough to be dropping cones onto the fresh wet paint so vehicles do not drive over it. There's a lot of moving parts, high pressure, traffic, a lot of things going on at one time and we're all working together. There's a lot of prep work before to make the lines straight. There's a lot of pulling of lines. Most of our equipment has guidelines and markers. It's a very rewarding job working for the Public Works Department. Lots of things go on and you stay in touch with the heartbeat of our city. We're here today to make a couple street names. There was some vandalism in town, and we're just going to make replacements. And the roads today we're doing are Dundas Street and Bruce Avenue. They're all 8 inch, and we use three different sizes, mostly 24 inch, 32 inch, and 36 inch. We do use a consistent font with street names. This is actually my metal blank, so the only material here is the material that I actually will cut out in vinyl. From here, we have to take out the vinyl that's not needed, which is the outer. So all we want to do is save the inside border. From here, we actually have to put a tra transfer tape on it. And what this does is it allows us to take the blue vinyl and pull it away from the clear backing that it's on so we can apply it to our aluminum blank. Now that we have our two sheeted piece of 
vinyl, we take our aluminum blank, which has high density diamond grade, which you can see behind me, we have all different colors. We have orange, yellow, white, depending on the type of signs. Most of our white signs are regulatory and the yellow ones are warning signs. And right here, all I'm doing is pushing the transfer tape a little tighter to the vinyl. And then from there, we peel it back, our plastic, which basically leaves us with a big sticker. We put it on the aluminum. And when we're done here, we take our transfer tape off and as you can see, we're left with Dundas. We're here uh, at Bruce and Dundas. Um, somebody's stolen the street names that were here, so we're here to replace them. Our sign shop has just generated us two signs, so I'm gonna go through the process of uh, putting it together and reinstalling the street names. First thing, we gotta center the signs. We do everything on this truck. We've got all the equipment on here to build, install, remove, repair, um, whether it's street signs, street names, uh, posts, banners. Um, Christmas decorations and so forth. I'm going to uh, basically just put the sign in the brackets and we'll be doing both signs of course. So I've got a cross bracket that I'm going to put in. And then add the top sign which is this street we're on, Dundas. Sorry, do the same there. We put the street that we're coming up to on the bottom so they all basically have the same. The cross street will be on the top. We've got to put some bolts in to secure them so nobody will steal the street name. We're ready to go. Just put this back and we'll go out and install this where the missing one is. Every year we do what we call a stop sign survey where we go around and find item on the agenda are reports and the first uh, 12A is development variance permit application number DVP 425-508. 8th Street. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. And maybe if I can just ask if we bring up attachment D while I'm introducing the item. Uh, so, Your Worship, as you mentioned, this is a development variance permit in order to allow for an LED uh, sign on the property at 508 8th Street. As outlined in the report, this is replacing an existing freestanding sign. Uh, LED signs are not permitted under the bylaw, but at the time the bylaw was adopted, there was criteria established to evalu evaluate applications as they come forward. Uh, in this case, staff have looked at the guidelines and, and believe that this application uh, meets, with, meets with those requirements and are recommending approval. I know you do have a delegation this evening, uh, but I'm certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay before we hear from Mr. Large? Seeing none, uh, good evening, Mr. Large. Can you hear me okay? Good, good evening, yes, I believe I can. I've got a little bit of a delay here. Hang on two seconds, sorry. I'm gonna just close this one. There we go, sorry about that. All right, thank you. You have five minutes when you're down to four minutes and one, pardon me, when you've used four minutes and you have one minute left, I'm going to interrupt and say you have a minute left. Uh, but otherwise, if you sure. would introduce yourself for the record and your address and we're away to the races, please. Sure. Um, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Large. Um, it's respect to uh, 508 8th Street up in Nanaimo. Um, I'm the general manager for the Liquor Plus group on the island and um, just want to briefly speak on development permit application number DVP 425 on 8th Street, 508 Street there. I know it's getting really late, so I'll make this super quick for everybody. Um, as mentioned in the staff report for decision, we've done a substantial renovation to the property um, and in turn the building. Um, and as part of our project, we researched the potential of adding an LED sign to an existing um, freestanding sign there, as you can see in the little red circle there. Um, so, 
in the um, staff report for decision lays out all the technical aspects of the sign, which I can just leave because I know, like I said, it's getting late. I just wanted to touch base on some things from a business perspective for us. Um, we feel the overall design of the new signage is aesthetically pleasing and maintains a complementary design to the area and does not conflict with any of our neighboring businesses. Um, as being an island-based uh, business, um, we have a natural bias towards supporting and stocking products from local breweries, distilleries, wineries, and cideries uh, located on Vancouver Island, in particular um, from Nanaimo and surrounding areas for this specific location. Um, as these companies are smaller and operate on a much less um, of a marketing budget than some of the multinational brands, we feel that an LED sign can enable these companies to provide us with digital artwork um, for products that we carry in the store at a much lower cost than supplied marketing materials. And we can display those regional products on this sign. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to focus on uh, marketing to the region for products made uh, in the region. Uh, the last quick little note that I wanted to make before I can uh, answer any questions that you may have is that um, seeing the signage is a uh, um, software is uh, cloud-based. Um, within minutes, we can change something. So um, for us, it's the proposed offering of the signage would um, have the ability to um, display uh, critical public safety notices. For example, Amber Alerts, um, disaster and critical public notifications, display things such as like the Emergency Preparedness Month, as well as showcase any uh, community events or um, charitable um, non -for, not for profit organizations that need some 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 help throughout the day. Um, that's really all I kind of wanted to bring up with respect to our side of things, other than what's in the technical aspect of the report from staff. So I just wondered if you had any, you or council have any questions for me that I can answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Large. Any questions for the delegation? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, it's no, you're not uh, popping up, by the way, Councillor Gesselbrock. Sorry. Uh, through your worship, uh, the delegation. Uh, what what are the business hours for the for for the um, business? I, I can't. I must have missed it. The the liquor store is open from nine a.m. to um, eleven p.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's all for questions. Councillor Brown. No. Councillor Martman. I'd like to move the recommended motion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? Councillor Brown. Thank you, Worship. Um, nothing against this particular application. I've consistently voted against variances for LED lighting and will continue to do so. I think the proliferation of lighting in our town is getting to extreme levels. It's uh, uh, very obtrusive um, and uh, I think it's damaging to our connection to the stars, and I think that's important. So I'm going to consistently vote against these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Brown. All those in favor of the motion? Councillors Armstrong, Martman, Hemmons, Krogh, Thorpe, and Bonner. Opposed? Councillors Gesselbrock and Brown. Thank you very much. Motion carries. The next is liquor license application number LA144 Unit 275 Front Street. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this application may look familiar to Council as we were before you in August with an introduction of this item. Uh, since that time, there's been public engagement consultation done, and we're here this evening uh, to present that the findings of that work and also to seek Council's final recommendation to be forwarded to the uh, liquor, liquor branch. Uh, in this case, uh, it's important to note that the requested change is to the hours of operation and currently a uh, liquor license at the facility is from 5 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. The proposed change would be uh, to start earlier in the day from 10 a.m. with the same end of day time of 1.30 a.m. So 10 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. is the proposed time. Uh, the 
property has been operating as a licensed facility since 2015 and is under a good neighbor agreement. Uh, the application has been referred to the RCMP who have indicated no concerns with the change to liquor license. There was, as I mentioned, the, the community consultation. There were 72 uh, responses received, 52 generally categorized as in favor and 24 against. Uh, certainly happy to take any questions, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Any questions for Mr. Lindsay? Seeing none, uh, we have a delegation, I believe. She left. She left. She's no longer online, Your Worship. I, I don't blame her. We'd all like to leave, but we can't. <laughs> Moving the recommendation, Councillor Hemmons, seconded Councillor Martman. Any discussion? Councillor okay. Martman. I just want to speak to this very briefly because there's been a lot of talk about this on social media and um, some I responded to and especially that there was a feeling that this was staff that was impeding this from going forward. I made it very clear that this was simply an application to the BC liquor <laughs> board and this was whether we recommended it or not. The majority of people, as Mr. Lindsay stated, were in support of it. it. It was not opposed. And those that opposed were really concerned about the um, noise level or music, etc. cetera. But um, I don't anticipate music during the day, especially at 10 a.m. And so um, I'm definitely in favor of supporting downtown businesses and the expansion of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Martman. Seeing no further speakers, all those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is the acting mayor schedule, Ms. Gurry. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. So every year, this report comes before you as required in Section 130 of the Community Charter, um, which requires that an acting mayor schedule be um, put in motion by council so that an acting mayor can act in any absence of the mayor. So there are two options in front of you um, this evening. The first option is um, the, a rollover of this year's um, acting mayor calendar. It is a compressed version, however, due to the um, general election in October um, of 2022. The second option is just a random um, name generator. Um, it, it randomly selects your time slots. So those are the two options that you have to choose from this year. Thank you very much, Ms. Gurry. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Just to get it moving, uh, I will move that, uh, that option one, uh, the 2022 acting mayor schedule be adopted. Uh, seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion, anyone? I think we're all happy. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is D, Council Procedure Bylaw Amendment, Electronic Meeting Provisions. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Worship. So this report is before you um, because, as you know, there's been COVID um, in our lives since 2020. And since June 17, 2020, local governments have been operating under Ministerial Order Number M192. This order authorized council and committee meetings and public hearings to be conducted electronically during COVID pandemic. On June 1st, 2021, Bill 10, Municipal Affairs Statutes Amendments Act, was passed, and as part of that bill, changes to the community charter were added to provide municipalities the authority to continue conducting regular council and committee meetings electronically, in addition to special meetings already authorized in the charter. So this amendment to our procedure bylaw is to update it to allow for more um, than two electronic participants, which is currently noted in our procedure bylaw, and to allow for electronic participants as needed in a closed meeting, which currently our um, procedure bylaw does not allow. So this brings us um, up to um, up to our current processes that we have where there's been a lot of opportunities and advantages to being able um, to have council attend per, um, electronically. It has allowed for quorum in committee meetings. And so there are advantages to being able to have this um, in our procedure bylaw. So Bill 10 allows municipalities to um, have council attend electronically if it is provided for in their bylaw. And so we are asking council to um, proceed with 
readings of a bylaw that um, allows for electronic participation. The one other housekeeping matter is that since we have changed August to be a, a break for council and no meetings during August, we um, want to add that there is a second meeting in July, which we have been holding a special meeting in July the past couple of years, um, just because it is quite a large break between the July date and the September um, after the August break. So um, those are the amendments that are proposed. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gurry. Any questions for Ms. Gurry? Seeing none, Councillor Brown, you want to read out motion one? I will move the recommendation. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, that Council Procedure Bylaw Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7272.03, to authorize the holding of electronic meetings and remote participation by Council members, past first reading. Second to Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any contrary, none. Motion carries. Councilor Brown. I would move that Council Procedure Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7272.03, pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. Discussion, Councillor Armstrong. I have a question, because in there it says that you need 24 hours notice, but if something came up, is a, is a council member able to do it like within 12 or 10, varying circumstances? Um, y yes, um, through your worship to Councillor Armstrong, it does say that, um, and that is just for um, procedural purposes. Shorter notice, as long as we could um, accommodate, that would be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Councillor Brown. And I would move that Council Procedure Bylaw Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7272.03, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is E, Council Policy Reappointments to the Board of Directors of the Regional District of Nanaimo. Ms. Gurry. It's the Sheila show tonight, <laughs> rather than Dale gets to sit there now. Um, so this report- he's, so upset he's going to take a holiday, he's so jealous. Yes, yes. Um, so this report is in front of you as um, a continuation of Ms. Robertson's presentation to you uh, a month or two ago, where you repealed 100 council policies. And we are working on our next steps, which is amending some pol policies that council policies that are in need of amending. This was one of those identified, whereas it was created in 1999, adopted by council in 1999, and it stated that seven directors were required for the RDN Regional District of Nanaimo Board. We now know that that has been changed to eight, so that was one of the amendments that was necessary in this policy, as well as some um, clarity around the experience and um, and um, voter confidence rules. So the policy proposed for you is attachment A, the new policy, attachment B being the um, previous current policy that is in place. So we are asking that council repeal the existing policy and adopt the new policy, which would allow for you to still have that flexibility for appointments, but um, it provides clarity to the appointments to the um, Regional District of Nanaimo Board. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Councillor Brown. Sorry, I'm having I'm having some difficulties. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this one is a little bit yes, um, more kind of a convoluted. Yeah. So do you have a question, Councillor? I do. Brown? Yes, sir. I was having difficulties pulling it up on my iPad. Um, the one. Um, Nope, sorry, it's answered. Okay, I will move the recommendation if there's no questions. It's answered already. And, and just to clarify the way Ms. Robertson has um, laid it We're out in the it. report, the re recommendation that's outlined, option one, ah, yes. it, the, the end part is that council appoint the following eight members of council and then insert names here. So because the Regional District of Nanaimo is looking for their annual appointments, um, would it be the same eight that you currently have with Councillor Turley being the alternate? Yes. And that is the way we would put those um, names in there. And then the votes would be as noted in the report under the recommendation as well, just for clarity. And we're all clear on Councillor Brown's motion? 
And is there a seconder, Councillor Hammond? I, I do have a question, though. How, oh, Councillor Brown, is a question? I, my e-scribe notes. I couldn't get it working. Um, <laughs> so, in the policy, it defines the number of votes. I'm just wondering if it needs to, because that's probably going to be subject to change with each census. So the vote allocation, 37 in total, will be assigned as follows. So this would be laying it out um, every year as to who would get the number of votes, the weighting. That is an option that council has had in the past. They could um, alter the number of votes based on that voter confidence. It's up to the council here how they want to distribute those 37 votes but um, the policy would state that it would be laid out as it is in the policy. Sorry, my, my question is not so much around how they get allocated, it's that 30, 37 will probably be subject to change yes. each census. So is that just we update the policy every time? Exactly, okay. we would bring the policy back here for amendment, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No further discussion, all those in favor? Any contrary, motion carries, thank you very much. The next is Business License Bylaw 2021 number 7318 and Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw 2021 number 7041 decimal 03. And we're back to the Dale Lindsay Show. Thank you, Worship. And in the interest of time, I'll introduce the next two items as they're related. Um, so items F and G are both related to a presentation you had back in July at your uh, GPC meeting. Miss um, Davidson was there that afternoon and she presented on general amendments to our business license bylaw. So coming out of that, uh, the committee made a recommendation to proceed with uh, updates and changes to our bylaw. And also through as, uh, as was noted earlier, Ms. Robinson's been doing an, a significant amount of work around our bylaw. So part of that has been moving anything related to fees to our bylaw enforcement bylaw. So this will, the second part of the second report, uh, item G, will actually uh, move forward with moving those portions of the bylaw over to our bylaw enforcement bylaw. So we have all of those in, in one place. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, motion, if you scroll up just a little bit on the screen here, you'll see the motion from the, uh, the other way, please. You'll see the GPC motion. And then there, I just want to make a note, there was also a second motion from council on that day about bringing down the liquor license. Um, business license fees from eleven hundred dollars to 165 which is in line with all other uh, businesses in, in the community so i just wanted to make note of that and we're receiving or sorry we're requesting council consider first three readings of the bylaw following that there will be notice uh, placed in the paper of, of these proposed amendments before we come back for adoption happy to take any questions thank you mr lindsay any questions from any members seeing none councillor brown Thank you, Your Worship. I would move that Business License Bylaw 2021, number 7318, to regulate the operation of businesses within the City of Nanaimo pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Brown. I would move that Business License Bylaw 2021, number 7318, pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And I would move that Business License Bylaw 2021, number 7318, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Councillor Brown. I would move the Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7041.03, to add business license fees, pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Brown. I would move the Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7041.03, pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Brown. And I would move the Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw 2021, number 7041.03, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw Business License Fine Schedule. Mr. Lindsay, we, uh, as, as announced, we've gone through this. Any questions? Seeing none, Councillor Brown. 
I would move that bylaw notice enforcement bylaw 2021 number 7159.13 to replace the fine schedule for the business license regulation bylaw pass first reading. Seconded Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Councillor Brown. I would move that bylaw notice enforcement bylaw 2021 number 7159.13 pass second reading. Seconded Councillor Martman. All the, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Brown. I would move that bylaw notice enforcement bylaw 2021 number 7159.13 pass third reading. Seconded Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is property tax exemption bylaw for 2022 property taxes. Ms. Mercer. I'm the closer tonight. <clears throat> so the community charter identifies situations in which council um, may exercise discretion in granting full or partial tax exemption. And these exemptions must be adopted by bylaw before October 31st of the preceding year. So in making recommendations to council, the reviewer ensures among other things that the goals, policies and general operating principles of the municipality as a whole are reflected in the organizations that receive municipal support. Um, exemptions are not given to services that are otherwise provided on a private for-profit basis and as this would provide an unfair um, competitive advantage. And the services provided by the organization should benefit, should provide benefits and be accessible to the residents of the city of Nanaimo. And in an appropriate age range, the organization's rec, um, regulations must allow all residents of Nanaimo to participate at a reasonable fee. So based on all of those that we had in 2021, seven properties added to the bylaw. We talked about these at I believe the last council meeting. Uh, Nanaimo Association for Community Living had a, at its location at 3425 Uplands Drive. Woodgrove Senior Citizens Housing Society at 1125 Seafield Crescent. The Ah and Buddhist Society at 587 7th Street. We had three properties for the Nanaimo Affordable Housing Society. One at 858 Georgia Avenue, 77 Mill Street, and one at 10 Buttertubs Drive. And to wrap it all up, the Trinity United Church at 6011 uh, Dumont Road. Uh, we had four properties removed from the bylaw as well. So the trustees of the Mountain View Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses um, at their property at 6011 Dumont Road, which is now the Trinity United Church location. And there was three properties in uh, at 285 Prudhoe Street. Two of them um, were related to the Denimo 710 Club and one for the options for sexual health. So 110 organizations representing 166 properties are listed within the bylaw. And the 2021 value of exemptions was just over $1.6 million. So the bylaw is up for um, your consideration tonight. Thank you very much, Ms. Gurry. Merce Mercer, sorry, it's getting late. Any questions? Councillor Brown? Sorry, Your Worship, I did have a question. Um, so is Councillor Bonner for some reason, but I'll just turn Here's a question. switch on. Councillor oh, Bonner, you have a question. I oh, pardon me, Ms. Mercer. Councillor Bonner has a question. Thank you. Um, Unusual. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to staff, if I may. Um, very long, long time ago, when I was on the Grants Advisory Committee before Council kicked me off, um, I was. Uh, we did a study on um, how um, we might be changing the permissive tax exemption, making it going three to five years, looking at various partial exemptions, that sort of thing. Did any of that um, come to fruition? Um, through your worship to Councillor Bonner. So we've had a review of the permissive tax exemption process on our books for a few years. Um, we had planned on doing it this year. We've had some staffing challenges. Uh, we have staff turnover and now the manager of revenue services is retiring. So we are kind of trying to wrap up some other things before we get to that. Um, I'm hoping that the new manager will, that will be one of the projects that we get onto right out of the gate. Um, 
but as of right now, we haven't made any changes to the process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bonner. Councillor Brown? I would move that property tax exemption bylaw 2021, number 7332, to provide exemption from 2022 pro property taxes past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Councillor Brown? I would move that property tax exemption bylaw 2021, number 7332, pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And I would move that property tax exemption bylaw 2021, number 7332, pass third reading. Seconded, Councillor Martman. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is appointment of bylaw enforcement officer. A late item, Mr. Lindsay. They're all late items now, aren't they? Thank you, Worship. I didn't want to let Ms. Mercer have the last word, so I snuck a late report on. <laughs> uh, Worship, just a quick one. We're just seeking council support in appointing uh, Natalie Frey as a bylaw enforcement officer, and this is for the purposes of enforcing the animal <laughs> responsibility bylaw. Certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Moved, Councillor Brown. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next are bylaws, parks, recreation, and culture regulation amendment bylaw 2021 number 707873, pardon me, decimal 08. I would move that parks and recreation and culture regulation amendment bylaw 2021 number 7073.08 to remove sections that will be administered under the animal responsibility bylaw and replace the violation and penalty section be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw 2021 number 7159 decimal 12. Councillor Brown. I would move that Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw 2021 number 7159.12 to amend the fine schedule for the Parks, Recreation and Culture Bylaw and add a fine schedule for the Animal Res Responsibility Bylaw be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Martman. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is 13C, Climate Action Reserve Fund Bylaw 2021, number 7330. I would move that Climate Action Reserve Fund Bylaw 2021, number 7330, to establish a Climate Action Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Gesselbrock. <coughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. We do like to be an equitable employer here. The next is property tax exemption uh, bylaw Island Corridor Foundation 2021 number 7331. I would move that property tax exemption bylaw Island Corridor Foundation 2021 number 7331 to provide a 10 year permissive tax exemption. 2022 to 2031 inclusive be adopted. Uh, excuse me. I... Yeah, just one, um, Your Worship. Um, I just reminding Councillor Gesselbrock that he should remove himself for this vote. I think you're absolutely correct in that. And Councillor Gesselbrock has removed himself, so let's vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Let the record show Councillor Gesselbrock withdrew himself. Perhaps we can bring him back, or pardon me, that's the, well, just hang on, hang on. Not for the climate action. Uh, sorry, yes, thank you. Property tax exemption bylaw, Island Corridor Foundation, 2021, number 7331. Sorry. Which we just read. Sorry. I, I confused you with the. I was so yes. many people waving hands back and forth. Thank you very much. I didn't vote. <laughs> Your Worship, if I may, uh, motion to adjourn. Sorry? Motion to adjourn. Uh, we, we have no. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's a few other things. We have no notices of motion, no other business. Question period. I assume we have no question periods. Councillor Brown's motion, motion to adjourn, seconded by Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Wait, I wanted to know there was motion. Uh,